Joy, you're all set. Oh, thank you. I was looking for thumbs. No problem. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the City of Coral Springs City Commission workshop. If we could have a call to order and the roll call. Certainly. Vice Mayor Carter. Present. Commissioner Sarah. Yeah. Commissioner Vignola. Here. Commissioner Simmons. Not yet. And Mayor Brooke is expected shortly. City Manager Babinick. Here. City Attorney Hearn. Here. Okay, if we could have a moment of silence to bring peace and goodness to all who could use it. Thank you. And now, City Manager Babinick, if I could have you lead us in the pledge, please. Sure. <clears throat> pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. City Attorney Hearn, could you please read the virtual statement? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Due to the ongoing state of emergency as a result of the novel coronavirus disease, this public meeting is being held using communications media technology in accordance with Resolution 2020-16 of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs. The city has taken several measures to ensure the requirements of 120.54 Florida statutes, as well as the spirit of the Florida Sunshine Laws, comply with during this unprecedented time. As you are aware, the governor has allowed these virtual meetings under executive order and as an update, that was to expire on June 30th, and he extended that to August 1st, 2020. So we will continue having these virtual meetings. And consistent with the spirit of the Sunshine Law, this meeting is a workshop, so it will not have no, any public participation, but it's available for viewing live on City TV, which is Blue, Blue Stream Channel 725, 25, and 25.7, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. You can also see it online where it's being streamed at coralsprings.org backslash City TV and can be heard live on City Radio 1670 AM. For those individuals that do not have access, if they are outside, we are also streaming it live via television at 9500 West Sample Road by the parking garage. Um, if you are there or planning to attend, uh, you are required to wear a mask and practice social distancing. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. Okay. We'll start with our workshop items. Number one, the expanded dispatch communications, Kathy Liriano. Vice Mayor, if I may. Um, yes, <clears throat> Vice Mayor, we gave a presentation on this uh, at a workshop two weeks ago, and uh, we had one-on-ones with all of the commissioners uh, since. Um, the purpose for this item to be on the agenda for today was to get consensus to bring it forward to a commission meeting for a vote. We have no presentation, but we are here to answer questions should any of the commission have any. Again, I'm just looking for consensus. Should we uh, bring this to a commission meeting? Uh, are there any further questions uh, from any of the commission? All of the backup documentation was sent out. The, uh, the cost uh, analysis, the uh, proposed contract for services. And again, uh, we've had the opportunity to meet with the commission one-on-one on, one on this. So we'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions or have any discussion the commission desires. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? Okay, do we have consensus to move this forward to an agenda item? I see Sean nodding his head. Commissioner Vignola, I can't hear you. Nope. There you go. No questions or don't move it? Uh, don't move it and no questions. Okay, Commissioner Simmons. Okay, so we have two yeses and one no out of the three that are present. Do you want to wait to ask when the other two are here? I will defer to John for advice on that. Yeah, I mean, we can, uh, um, you know, bring that back. I, I mean, if you want to wait for the two to see if we have consensus, consensus in, in with our commission is if no one is strongly objecting and there's a majority, that's consensus. So um, if it, it's probably good since we have a two one just to bring the other two in just to make sure because we don't have in theory, it could become a, a two-three not to bring it forward. 
So we'll wait then, uh, Vice Mayor, for when the other uh, two commissioners come on um, to just bring it back up. Yeah, that's, that's a best move. Okay. To item number two, the business plan with Catherine Gibbons. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be turning this uh, presentation over to Catherine. Um, <clears throat> but before we do, uh, I just want to kind of walk through a couple things. Um, as with the budget process, uh, you know, obviously this is a process that is year round. Uh, although we're in budget season right now, um, the budget is continual and the planning uh, for the budget is continual and, and strategic planning is continual. So a lot of hard work has gone into the presentation you're going to see tonight. Um, I want to thank all of our staff for everything that they have done, all of the work they have done. Uh, these are difficult times on many different uh, um, areas, but uh, in general, some of our revenues are going to be affected by our current uh, COVID crisis and our budget team will go through that with you. Um, we have a comprehensive um, presentation and at the end of the presentation, we'll be happy to have any discussion, answer any questions. But again, I just want to thank staff for all of their work. We asked, this was not a normal budget season. We asked staff to do a lot of different scenarios and basically the staff had to uh, develop uh, three or four budgets in some cases to get to where we are today. So Catherine, I will turn it over to you. Thank you and hello everyone. Welcome to our business plan workshop. This is your time to go through the plan of what's in and what's out for next year's budget. The business plan are the words behind the budget and the, uh, are the, word, the, the business plan are the words behind the budget and the budget are the actual numerical amounts of that. So what does that mean? There are a lot of numbers and a lot of words that we're gonna go through tonight, but we're gonna do it all together. And uh, this is the time to question again as ask for clarity uh, as we move through this budget process. Come September during the budget hearings, this is why it goes so smoothly, because we've had the chance to discuss the budget multiple times uh, in a year. Right off the bat, I'd like to thank my staff as their dedication to this budget has been fierce. Imagine processing three budgets on a tiny laptop screen when you've been used to having larger monitors with changing timelines, asking for, shall I say, I'll ask for very tight turnarounds. Um, this is truly a dream team and I certainly couldn't have done it with, without them. So I really appreciate their effort as well. All right. So tonight, the evening is as follows. We're going to spend time on the first two sections and I'm going to ask for your patience for this part as it sets the stage on how and why our decisions were made. And we'll go through the current fiscal conditions, the over fund overviews, business initiatives. Alex will talk to us about some of the city events. Dale will talk about the commission meeting time. This is something that you've asked to, to bring back and then we'll go through the next steps. The current economic conditions that we are in, um, some conditions are positive while others are not, but these are the conditions that we're in today. Clearly COVID, a time of social change, great strong real estate market, um, a volatile stock, stock market and a slowing of consumer confidence and business closures. These are all things that we had to consider while uh, developing this, this budget. All right. Since I joined about five years ago, every budget has had its own challenges or big uphill budget theme. Um, Melissa Heller has joked with me that I will have a normal budget, uh, but this, this budget um, became apparent and she challenged me and then said, is there ever really such a thing? Because looking back to the early 2000s, before Hurricane Wilma in 2005, the city and surrounding cities have been on a wild ride of a hurricane, then a recession, hurricane recession, and now a pandemic, and all the other environmental conditions that you saw in that previous slide, but we always seem to be in a game of catch up from the last revenue crisis. So we've been spending the last 15 years to obtain reimbursements from at least one, sometimes two hurricanes. But the one thing is clear is that we have to be our own safety net. And that was really great advice. This budget 
focuses on adapting to rapidly changing conditions while ensuring that our residents and businesses continue to receive quality services. More than ever, our budget needs flexibility to address our community needs. And this flexibility is possible because of the city's dedicated and innovative staff that continues to adapt to our changing priorities without sacrificing services to our residents and businesses. That said, during the past year, during budget kickoff, by the way, budget kickoff is a staff event that kicks off the budget season. Um, even though we start planning for the next year's budget moments after the, the budget is adopted, we ask departments for three overall tasks. The tasks are, and they take hours to be able to do three things. Budgets, uh, department directors are annually tasked to review and compile 18 different items, such as the department mission, the core processes, the key performance indicators, staffing, all these different 18 elements. So they have to do that. The second thing is that they need to formulate multiple budget situations. This is very different than in years past. Normally it's only one, but I'm gonna walk you through what those are. And three is the question was asked, can we afford to own what we currently own? Well, the answer to that is no, but we're gonna talk about that this year um, and how we can fully address this um, in the future years, but that's gonna be a part of the presentation as well. So let's go into those uh, budget scenarios. Here are the budget scenarios. Let's start at this first box right here. And this is where my cursor is. This is prior to COVID. This is where we started the budget process. As I said, right when you start, right when we go to a, adopt a budget, my team starts working on the following year's budget. So this is what we were looking at. And we always look at five-year forecasts. So um, that just starts with that plan. This is what I call what would have been. Had we, we had had a positive five-year forecast with sworn contract increases, contractual escalators, 3% increases for merit for our employees, a small surplus to be able to start the budget refinements and revenues typically go up um, at this point, uh, depending on if the economy is stable and or better. Our conversation would have been with, uh, with the, uh, what additional enhancements to be made in the community. Uh, we would have started to be able to paying on what we own, possibly additional programming and addressing aging infrastructure and no millage increase would be needed to close a gap. Looking at, if you're a numbers person like myself, this is the number that we were forecasting, that one um, $136 million. Again, you can see the, the revenues are a little higher. That's why we have a surplus there. Now, then COVID happened. COVID happened right in here. At that point, we began a situation where the revenue stage door dropped out from the bottom and we had to chase that revenue gap downwards. So after analyzing where we're predicted to fall, we're forecasting right around 130 million. Now, this is actually a good, we do incorporate the increase of uh, property values in this number as well. So you can see how much revenue really did come out when we did have an increase in our property taxes increasing. Now, the, the key of this is when we gave out department budgets, we didn't know about this $130 million number. All we knew was we are, we are closing service, uh, we're having to close down certain facilities that charges for services. We're seeing um, information from the federal level, from the state level saying that um, consumer spending is stopping and sales tax. And so we didn't know how bad it would be. And we still, to be honest, we, we really don't. We can only go off of some of our forecasts. So when we gave the department budgets, their budgets, we asked them to give us three different budgets back. One, go back to your 2020 levels and include these increases. So the increases of the sworn contractual increases, the contractual escalators and the 3% for merit. When we did that, um, and you, we do not want to see any changes in, in service levels. So when we did that, the departments had to reduce their budgets for a combined $4 million. Or we could say, we'll, we'll close that gap by a millage increase of 0.3858, just letting you know that's a point of reference. Now, we had to make it a little bit more um, severe, again, not knowing how bad it was going to be. At that point, we went back and asked 
2020 levels plus these increases. Now go even further, go into your operations by 2%, cut that out. What does that look like? That looks like $3.4 million getting cut out of the budget or a 0.598 millage um, rate increase needed to be able to close that gap. Or even further down, um, same thing, 2020 increases, go down 5%. What does that yield? That's about $10 million that we would be, or an increase of 0.9161. What we found is clear that a reduction that in this scenario, in this minus two scenario, in the minus five scenario, is the reduction in employees and service levels is for certain would happen, would have to happen. And extreme cuts, job losses um, would be occurring in this particular example in, in five. And some departments actually even had some of those cuts in 2020. So what we knew we had to do um, at that point was try to say, how are we going to be able to keep our workforce intact? How are we gonna still be able to keep our same service levels? And at that point it became, well, we're not gonna be in one different scenario. It's great that we had all three. Um, so we could try to piece together a, a budget um, so that we could be able to, to still accomplish some of these things. Now I have to give credit where credit's due. Uh, praise for Stephen and his team and IT and John and city attorney's office and those people in purchasing that worked to be able to contact people, um, other other companies on the contractual escalators to try to bring that number down as much as possible. They, to reduce our fees, they did a great job on trying to reduce that. So they were able to keep that cross cost growth down and I really appreciate their efforts in doing that. So that was very helpful. What our budget considers, the assumptions are some of the revenues are positive and others are negative. Thus, that's why we are in a state to say that our revenues are variable, uh, depending on which exact revenue you're analyzing. This is actually good because our revenues, we have a diversified revenue um, source and, and that's good. Clearly we all want our revenue sources to be positive, but in the absence of that, at least we have multiple. So property values. Property values are going up, um, have been going up. We had a very good year this year at a growth rate of 4.66%. So that's great, strong in Florida. Economies throughout the country are talking about this going forward and the South Florida region continues to show growth while the rest of the country in large minus a couple of large cities um, are showing a stall. Uh, so this is gonna continue to be a positive um, going into next season, uh, going into next budget. Our state revenues, this is the negative. Uh, we are still awaiting state estimates, which will be stated somewhere in July and August. We only have our predictions and asking our other cities uh, through many phone calls. Kim's been with me um, on emails, gauging our estimates off of other surrounding cities and in the state. Uh, so this is still gonna be that number that we're all um, waiting for. The charges for services are unknown, depending on the spread of social distancing and the, and the social distancing requirements, and this can change. So let me give an example. Let's say if we're only able to open at 60% of capacity in certain places, let's just say City Hall and the Mall, that's a $1 million revenue source for us, then we might be looking at our revenue going down by uh, going down to 600,000. So we're still, this is a, an area that is still variable for us. Um, but hopefully, um, um, hopefully we'll be able to get that information um, sooner than later. But until then, I do feel good about some of the estimates that we have. Uh, we're treating this situation with one-time financial tactics. Uh, we know that this is not gonna, or hope that this is not gonna be something that's gonna be along for um, the long-term, long-term meeting more than two to, to, two to five years. Uh, that's what we kind of look at in, in our terms. So, so we're looking at some one-time um, fixes. So we, what, what did we do? We liquidated other older capital and for the equipment services fund, we are not gonna charge the general fund the annual depreciation. We're able to keep a positive equipment service fund, however, not charge again the depreciation for a year. And that tactic is about a $3.2 million savings to the general fund. Now, the consequence of this is okay for one year. 
however risky for any future year, uh, therefore we can't repeat that. So that's kind of a one card down and, and that's, um, that's it. The next is that we are restricting travel. Fortunately, we're are leveraging available technology to continue to learn and grow through webinars that clearly, clearly in-person seminars are still valuable, but this is a one-time, one-year, um, hopefully, event. We know the we know the cost of healthcare continues to rise and is expected to rise at 5.5% is what I'm seeing over the next decade. However, a 5% increase in that fund is not something that the city can absorb. That said, a lot of work took place around the health fund to keep costs down by reopening an employee clinic and continuing the employee's cost share plan to increase the employee's cost share to a 85-15 split for uh, three years ago is 97-3 split. So we are continuing that plan. Mean, meaning more of the cost of healthcare is being moved to the employee. Dale, our Director of Human Resources, partnered with um, Hub, Brent, um, the city manager, and members of my team to whittle this to less than a 1% increase while keeping um, good health insurance and plans intact. Uh, this is very beneficial for all plans because this has a line item in all our funds. Um, so if this number goes up, then some of the expenses and other funds go up. If this number goes down. Then, then that number goes down. So great job to Dale. And I just wanted to kind of um, talk about this a bit. We're to continue the essential hiring practice into next fiscal year, hold on needed projects. We know there are repairs needed infrastructure. We are not fully funded. Um, so those are some of the one-time tactics that we're doing. Now we have appropriations listed here. If needed, we did not build the general fund budget needing to go from fund balance. That's something we're using for this year to close the gap in 2020. Um, but if our state numbers come in and it's a million dollars left, or if it's something really, um, really steep, then that's something that we do have available to ourselves. Or as we go into next fiscal year, then, then we may need to be able to use that. So we'll continue um, looking at financials clearly as our normal process is, we go through and look at our financials on a monthly basis. Uh, one thing that the city manager and I have talked about is having a quarterly recommended action. If things are moving forward the way we believe they will, then we will continue on business as um, we have um, said in the budget. However, if uh, we're seeing that uh, times are, are not as good at that point, we will clearly make a, a recommended action um, change internally. So consequences of, to the operation, I've touched on some of these already, but training is clearly very important to city staff. We are a leader in city government and organizational um, structure, and we take that to heart and we want to be the best at delivering service levels. And this piece goes kind of against that uh, principle of being exceptional. However, we wanna keep the team together and for one year we'll find alternatives and hope more offerings are online, less expensive for a year. We're all in this together um, within the world. So we're hoping that that's something that we can continue um, in, in future years. So other reductions are, I mentioned the training equipment, uh, reduce supplies, um, travel, meals, and lodging, that, um, that is re um, removed from um, most of the line items, performance incentives, reduced uh, fund balance, I've already mentioned that, and the museum subsidy, that's just something that will increase uh, uh, the general fund's responsibility. So what does this mean? Um, not to harp uh, on the negative. However, our city was just starting to get on the right side of financial um, sustainability. We're just starting to um, address the capital, as I talked about in that what would have been. Um, and we had an actionable strategic plan that was propelling the city forward. At this point, we are going to be delaying um, some things fiscally and things within our strategic plan. So for one, the the plan of increasing that reserve target uh, 15 to 25 percent. Um, our target, we're currently at 18 percent, um, but we have received one uh, 3.5 million. About another million has come in um, from Hurricane Irma over the past week. Great job, Alex. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if we had that 4.5 million to go into reserves, then we would be at about 21.5 percent. Um, 
right now. So that's one piece that will, um, that that is going to hurt us because at that point we can't put that money toward it. If Catherine, all, can you please repeat that one more time? Absolutely. If we would have been able to, you know what, and let me say it this way. If we were able to put all our ARMA reimbursement into our reserves, so the 4.5 million that we have, and we have about $3 million coming, then we would have been able to increase our reserve levels to about right under 24%. And that's where we were really trying to be able to go. Mm -hmm. So right now, if we were able to um, put that 4.5 million that we already have, it would have been about 21.5% in reserve. So um, that is going to delay our, uh, our plan there. Now, talking about the addressing our CIP plan, um, our recurring capital is still an area uh, of issue. Our one-time capital is is, is something that we only approved items, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Any current approved CIP was either broken, it was a health and safety um, item, it was needed for compliance, or it was a um, it was compromising a large um, scale operation. So we'll talk about that, but those are the only items that we really approved in this next year's budget when it came to the one-time capital. Developing the plans of to afford to own uh, what we currently own. This was something that we were all were moving forward with on the enhancing replacement plans for the facilities, all our AC um, and roof uh, repairs, and also uh, working with Rob on looking and revisiting that parks replacement items. Um, he had a great idea of adding fencing, which we're going to try to um, bite off small pieces of that, um, but it's it's something that we could have gone further with. Um, I just want to give a little secret on the on the facilities and the replacement plans. It's something that um, I've worked quite a bit with Rich Mashad. He can spend money, um, but he also has um, a great talent to be able to move forward on public works plans um, so that you can keep continuing uh, that operation. So we've been able to be able to keep some of our facilities, our, our AC and roof, but, um, um, and he's been able to do that very well, but we just need to put it on that overall plan. Um, that experience uh, to work with him has been so valuable, um, but just needing to get that uh, entire plan on a replacement item is something that we really need to be considering. On the establishing new replacement plans, um, our radio equipment, that's one that we were looking at. And the charter school CIP plan, this is one that will come before you for only uh, $50,000. This is something that we've been talking about, I know, as long as I've been here. Um, and at least we just need to start the plan now on having uh, 50,000. So that's gonna come back in front of you, but we should be having it in a um, for, uh, more. For the strategic plan, we are still moving forward within the strategic plan. However, we have delays in some of those milestones. The charter school is on hold. Uh, we will still continue to move that forward, um, just um, not right now. The public safety public works building, that is a delay in milestones due to funding. Amphitheater development on hold. Village square development has a delay, um, but we're still talking with them. Uh, the corporate park business development, uh, Christy has done, a, this is a different milestone. Uh, when this was set out to be on the strategic plan, it was to improve relations with the corporate park. And I think Christy's done a, a really great job there, especially with um, the environment that we're in now, um, having that, them know that they can contact her and we've been working with them. So that's why it's kind of different milestones than what it was. But at the same time, I think the intention is still there. The entertainment destination strategy, that's on hold. The co-working space development, university presence, that's on hold. I wanna say our staff is very much committed to the strategic plan. We've committed, we've completed 17 out of 23 projects. 18 were never gonna be completed this fiscal year, it was going to be um, a multi-year um, project. And the business completion, business plan completion has 83 out of 185 projects. So the staff is committed to delivering these outcomes. Um, I know that um, Frank has talked about this before on the fact that uh, we as city staff could have taken our foot off the gas, but we don't want to. We really wanted to try to, um, to keep those commitments and move that forward. Now, as far as new staff, um, we are proposing one 
add to staff, um, and this has no cost to the general fund. This position um, is for a pension coordinator. Um, she is already a part-time employee, but the police and fire pension boards are going to be funding this position. So her hours will go from part-time to full-time. This slide um, is, you've seen this probably before in, in years past. Um, we've kind of looked at different, we've substituted some different cities in here just because we wanted to keep it full service cities. So you may ask why um, Plantation isn't on here because it's not uh, full service, they contract out. Uh, for one of their public safety um, items. So this is just a look at all of the cities with um, uh, with full service. And at this point, uh, Frank, I know that you wanted to mention um, a couple points on this one. One of the reasons uh, that we we put this slide in here is we were asked, uh, you know, um, comparatively how we look from a staffing perspective. So I asked our budget team to to go out and do a comparison um, with with full service cities to kind of see what our per capita staffing is. And one of the things that we've prided ourselves on and, and do a great job at is the efficiencies uh, that our employees create. And um, that's, you know, we just want to make sure the commission had this information uh, that um, when we look at this, it just shows uh, that we are um, uh, at a staffing level that is very responsible uh, from a fiscal standpoint and very efficient, works very hard to, to get the job done. So we, we wanted to make sure we add this in here. I have been asked several times as to what our staffing looks like as compared to other cities. So that's why this is in here. You know, just uh, give me one moment uh, to make sure, Catherine, the average employee resident ratio of 11.72, that's just for these cities on the graph. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So there's a lot of information you're giving us to digest. I just want to give the opportunity to my colleagues that if they need to interject, by all means, just unmute, interject. If you can wait until Catherine's done, that's awesome. Uh, but if you feel pressed to, hey, I, I need something reiterated or repeated, uh, please just unmute and pipe in, okay? All right, I am muting myself, thanks. All right. This slide talks about some of the, the budget operational challenges and opportunities. Four of the circles are large collaborative projects. Um, some are challenges, some are opportunities, um, some budget impacts, most operational impacts. Um, let's talk about let's talk about them. So the ERP uh, project enterprise resource planning, we are behind this project. Uh, we are wanting it to succeed. We've talked about it before. In fact, Rob, led a virtual celebration um, yesterday that to keep the momentum going. Um, it is definitely an operational challenge just because it has many moving parts, many people in the organization, um, but we all are wanting this to succeed. The ADA initiative is another team collaborative product with Bob, uh, project with Bob, um, John's folks, um, Andrew, and Lynn's team with Matt. Uh, this is both um, operational and um, uh, budgetary challenges, uh, but it's a large, uh, large scale project. Uh, the dispatch communications, Frank, Bob, Stephen, uh, Chief Perry have all led us down this opportunity to expand. Uh, it is still a great um, workload on, on us. However, it is, um, there's no budget impact to this. Uh, there is operational impacts to this and it's an opportunity for us. Catherine, I would just like to clarify there there are budget impacts to this, but on the positive side, there's no negative budget impacts to this. So I do want to clarify that uh, there there the numbers that are in there are built in there to make sure that city staff time is covered, as well as uh, there there is a fee in there for the uh, service itself. Yeah, no, very true. Thank you for that. On this Question. on this one. Yeah. All right, um, so I know I, I'm a little late guys, so sorry about that. Um, uh, but we're gonna be circling back to, I think the first item I missed, which was the dispatch uh, agreement or whatever like that with, with uh, Coconut Creek. Are we, we're coming back to that, right? We are, we are coming back to it, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. You bet. 
public safety, uh, public works campus. These are some of the items that we do have uh, as budget challenges, uh, department requests and unfunded uh, capital improvement projects and um, the legislature. Uh, we never know what's going to be coming from them. Um, some unfunded mandates. Uh, we do know one that we're going to have to talk about next year, and that is for the police um, and fire pensions. They are changing the mortality tables, which has the potential of, um, of a negative um, budget impact for that. So more information to come next this time next year, but I'm just um, myself, um, Dale, um, serve on the police and fire pensions. It's something that we are working through right now. All right, I'm gonna take a pause right here and let's go through some of the current fiscal conditions. Uh, I've, we've talked about these um, in recent past and not, um, not a lot has changed here. So for the year in projection for the general fund, uh, uh, projections as of May, that is 67% of the year. Uh, we're estimating a, a deficit of about 4.3 million. The range that I still like to give is four to eight million. Forecasters still encourage a range as fluctuations and changes um, in market volatility are inevitable de during this time. One thing that you can't see just because it's so high level is that there is a $6 million loss of revenue. Um, so this number is not a 6 million, it is only 4.3. The difference is the operational um, cuts and reductions that we have been taking since this started to, uh, to combat, to not have to go so much out of, um, out of our reserves. So if you remember back in April, um, May, that my initial estimate of the revenues at risk, revenues coming out was about 5.9 million. Um, that is still that is still kind of tracking what we what we're doing. It's just what we're trying to do operationally to make it not be so much of a of a deficit in the general fund. Maybe before we move, yeah. Before we move off this slide, um, as soon as we saw this coming, we made changes to the operations. We started uh, cutting back on on spending wherever we could. We reprioritized and reallocated uh, capital. And we're also going to be using some of the reimbursement money from uh, Hurricane Irma. So we will not, although that money would have gone into our reserves, we're not actively looking to take any money out of our reserves, hoping we don't have to at this point to make up for this, uh, this uh, deficient amount here. So uh, at the end of the year, our goal is to finish out our budget while still having the 18% in our reserves. Uh, should we need that for any future uh, expenditures or, you know, we get a hurricane, God forbid, or something like that. But I do want to make it clear our plan is still that three-phased approach of reduced spending, reallocation of capital, and Hurricane Irma money to make up the differences to finish out this fiscal year. Got you, Frank. Thank you. For the fire fund? Uh, the year in projection, again, projections are as of May. This is 67% of the, the fiscal year. And Chief McNally and I have had many conversations on, on this projected deficit, and there is a plan here as well. Why is there a deficit? That is um, due to fire inspections and plan reviews um, being impacted by being able to um, go and do those inspections, um, as well as uh, Fire Academy had to... Um, had to drop the ability to hold some classes for a period of time during that. However, as I said, we have a plan. Uh, there's a capital item that we are not gonna need to move forward at that point that does have relief onto the fund as well as they are, they too have operational, uh, they have an operational line that will be able to absorb that, um, that, that deficit. So uh, the fire fund should be able um, to come in um, at around zero as well. And, and that's important to note that, you know, we do have line items in there for economic conditions, and this is an economic condition and, and contingency. So as Catherine said, uh, although we're estimating a, a deficient uh, here, we, we, we are able to cover it with the current budget. Our museum uh, fund. Uh, Melissa has walked this um, through you last month very well, and this is something that, um, again, uh, our numbers are not changing, about 114,365 
um, is that deficit, um, some of which was an obligation that the general fund was going to have to pay um, anyway, but this is just something that the general fund will, um, will cover and will um, include in the general fund. All right. So at this point, we're going to go over some of those fund overviews that we have. Uh, the, our next time in coming together is going to be uh, is scheduled to be July 22nd, where we talk about the where we talk about setting trim and setting the special assessment. So I'm going to be asking um, kind of consent um, consensus type questions to make sure that we're on the the right side of the fire assessment, solid waste assessment. Um, at this point. So um, after each one, I will make sure that we have consensus with what we're what we're looking at. Right now we're talking about the fire assessment and you can see the comparison on- Catherine, before you move forward with that. Sure. Um, one of the things I do want to preference before we go into this conversation is staff is not um, recommending any increase in the millage this year. Uh, we are recommending the millage stay flat. Uh, the cumulative increases in the fees for service are uh, just under uh, $10 total per year. Um, so staff has worked extremely hard to try to keep any kind of increases uh, very, very low to none. Um, and I just want to, I want to point that out. So you're going to see a couple increases here, but in totality, uh, what we're looking at is is uh, sub ten dollar per year increases uh, between uh, the fire assessment fee, the uh, water and sewer, and uh, solid waste. Is that correct, Catherine? That's what we're talking about. Yes. Thank you. So at this point, and I will say that I, we put our preliminary uh, 2021 uh, figure in there, and I don't know at this point other cities are. Um, having conversations with their um, commissions and councils as well. So we don't know what the other cities are doing at this point. Um, sometimes we know that by uh, by July, we, we we get to hear about that, what that looks like. Um, so in our, uh, some of the fire fund highlights are um, the the residential. This is gonna be our first year. You, you, you knew that we were moving toward having the single, uh, single family household versus a multifamily all just be talked about as residential. And this is the year that it's gonna show that way on, uh, the, on, the, on the tax notice. And last year, the rates were the same. And this year they'll see it will be the same. So the residential uh, will go from 227.82 to uh, 234.02. The commercial side will go down um, to 25.10. The industrial warehouse, um, you'll see that change in the institutional as well. Uh, these are based on calls for service, and that's why um, they, they, they change uh, throughout the year. It's smooth um, so that so you don't see a huge jump in one year to another, uh, but that is the, the rationale when you see uh, some, of these, some of these movements. Um, no ads to staff, um, continued focus on firefighter self, uh, safety and health, and some of the capital requests um, are, including, are included below. So the personal protective equipment uh, replacement, this was um, something that we knew uh, was coming. This is part of the work that um, Frank and I had worked on previously in years to make sure that we have replacement plans. This is what spawned the general fund for their some of their replacement in capital. And uh, this is just the year that we're having to pay for um, um, the, 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 the PPE year. Now, in future years that we are gonna be able to save up as we go um, and it won't be kind of that one big hit at, the, at one time. So um, those are the other projects, the self-contained breathing apparatus replacement plan, the fire stations painting and improvements, um, adding two vehicles to our fleet and to conduct a residential fire sprinkler feasibility study. One of the notes for the protective equipment is this is a required replacement. Uh, the protective equipment that's outlined here has a 10 year serviceability life. Once it hits that 10 years, it's actually, we, we can't use it. It's, it's, uh, it, it's actually against uh, state law to use any gear that falls in this category for more than 10 years. Um, so what we did was we actually split this up on a 5-5 five, five, uh, replacement cycle, meaning we're not getting hit with the full uh, cost of replacing all the personal protective equipment in one year. We, we, we replace it on the five-year cycles. 
So this will replace half of it in five years. We'll replace the other half of it. And as Catherine said, starting next year, we're going to start saving up for this. So it's not, we, we started that last year. We put that program in place, but going forward, it won't be all out of one fiscal year. It'll be cumulative and it'll be a, uh, it'll be a, a, a reduction in, in what we're looking to spend out of one year through a replacement cycle. So at this point, I'm going to pause and just make sure for the fire uh, for the fire assessment, I'm going to go back a slide um, so that you can kind of see. Um, I'm asking for consensus that um, this is this is what we will be bringing to you come July uh, 22nd, and really that's when you're going to vote on it. But I just want to make sure that um, I have consensus from from the commission. Or if you have any questions on this, please please. Catherine, ask. I, I would ask before you do consensus if you can explain trim, basically how the you know the, the numbers are set as a cap. Um, they can't go above that, but adjustments can be made um, prior to uh, the actual final approvals. Well, shoot, you did a good job just then. So when you set trim, um, you do. That is the highest, um, uh, the highest amount that you can go. You can't go above it. So um, when we do vote on, or when you vote on a, on July twenty second at the special hearing, then that is the highest um, you can. Um, you can charge. You can't go higher um, after if things go get worse, so to speak, um, then uh, we can't go higher in September. Um, we can come down. And I think that's what we've um, done in the past is um, if we're if we're a little bit on the on the on the border, it's something that we just want to go ahead and set it at the at the height and then we can always bring it down. Okay, go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you. I have a couple of questions regarding this slide. On the in, I mean, most of the increases seem. Uh, I'm sorry if my connection's bad. Um, most of the uh, fees seem reasonable. Uh, the industrial warehouse. I know you said it was based on calls, but that seems to be the largest jump. Is and I know there's variations every year as to how these fees adjust, but is that because we we're getting a lot of calls for that? Because that's the largest jump. Yes. It is, uh, we look at call volume every year, we smooth it over the course of three years. And that's what, um, that's, we actually saw last year on the institutional, um, institutional was the one that actually had the higher movement. So it's something that we do smooth out. We look at call volume, we, that's how we look at the actual data that drives um, the numbers behind it. Okay, that's reasonable with the three year um, overlay. So on the other items, considering the environment that we're in, I'm just wondering, I mean, I get the the 10 year use plan and I think it's very strategic and smart to break that out over the five years. Um, does that apply to the vehicles as well? We always have a, we are on a 10 year replacement. Well, depending on what type of vehicle, um, we have a replacement plan um, uh, that we've been doing. So whatever the useful life of the vehicle is, then absolutely. We look at our equipment services fund. That's how all of our fleet goes into and is a 10 year um, look at all of our equipment and replacing them. So we do want to buy. It's always cheapest to buy with cash, right? So we always save up. And when we do make our vehicle purchases, we have already saved up for what we are spending. And we um, we do that with cash as opposed to borrowing to pay any interest whatsoever. And we generally get a good deal uh, on, the, on that. Vice Mayor, and the reason you're seeing that here instead mm -hmm. of in the replacement plan is these are two ads to fleet. Uh, for many years, the fire department has heavily relied on T vehicles. Those are vehicles that have uh, served their useful life, but we've kept them longer because we didn't have replacement vehicles for them. And over the years, we've been taking those T vehicles out of the fleet uh, whenever we can because they tend to cost us more to keep in the fleet. So the reason you're seeing those two vehicles here is they first, they're out of the fire fund. And secondly, is because uh, we have T vehicles that are just we can't keep them on the road anymore. They're, they've they've truly reached their end of life now, and we have to have vehicles for those positions. No, I understand you, and you guys have always done a really good job with that. Even in our our field, you stretch them out beyond their useful life, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, this year being that things have changed and are tight for many, uh, is painting you know, a wise choice this year, just like the same thing with the fire feasibility study. I mean, is this something might be a better idea just to wait till next year? 
So that's a great question on the, the fire station painting and improvements. So what this covers is everything to do. Remember we talked earlier about being able to own what, what we be able to afford what we currently own. Well, in the fire stations, that's one of the areas that we are able to afford what we own because many years ago, uh, somebody set up a, a replacement plan for all the fire stations. And in that replacement plan, we account for carpet replacement. We account for appliance replacement. We account for AC replacement. We account for the bay floors. We account for the bay doors. We account for the lighting, the resurfacing of the parking lots. We account for the furniture, the beds. Um, we account for uh, the kitchen equipment. So it's not painting. It says painting and improvement. Uh, station painting and improvements, but painting is part of it, but it's everything that's within that station. And what we do is we take that long list of all of those items that are in the station and we put a number next to it of how many years of service we expect to get out of those. And then we smooth that cost out over this service life. And each year for all five of our stations and including fire administration, that's where that $103 comes from this year is its totality for all of our facilities associated with the fire department, including the fire academy. Okay, then that's a reasonable number <laughs> if it's based on all that. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah, if you ever want to see the spreadsheet, I'll be happy to <laughs> share it with you. Okay, and the residential feasibility study, I mean, that's min compared to everything else. Why is that important this year? Um, I would ask Chief McNally, that was his initiative, so I would ask him to uh, explain that. I'd be happy to. So uh, Bruce Bowers, our fire marshal, um, was uh, working on this with a, a Kenny White group. And one of the recommendations is to see how we can uh, try to encourage our residents, whether it's doing a uh, enhancement to their, to their structure, if there's a new building, to have a residential sprinkler system, as we know the life-saving capabilities of those. And in order to do that under state statute, we must first do a uh, feasibility study which would then require an ordinance change afterwards. But in order to even get off the ground to bring it to an ordinance to require and to promote it, the state is requiring us to do a feasibility study for that. Makes yeah. sense to me. You got something else, Vice Mayor? You're muted. Thought I fixed it, okay. So we get the study and go forward. And I think fire sprinklers are somewhat of a good idea, but it, is this one of those things like we did with the water hoses that we're going to have to go back and people are going to have to fix everything they don't already have? Okay, just making sure. Because no, th this would be a recommendation moving forward. And one of the things we've talked about in the past is finding incentives for people to sprinkle their homes. But this wouldn't, we, this wouldn't be something that we would put in place and say you have until 2025 to sprinkle your home. It would be moving forward. I'm good. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Anybody else on the team? Questions? Vice uh, Commissioner Vignola. Uh, Frank, I got a question for you about um, our, our fire fee with the, uh, the residential going to 234. It sounds, I mean, looking at what everyone else is, it looks pretty reasonable to me. Um, the city of Parkland, who, um, you know, we, you know, contract out the, the service to them, their fire fee is where? With the same same service. So I, I'm going to have to go back and look, Mike. I don't know if you have that number off the top of your head, um, but their fire fee, they actually kept their fire fee um, flat a couple of years in a row and paid the difference out of their general fund. So I don't know that they're in a position, and I don't want to speak for Parkland, but I know a couple of years back, they were in a position where the fire fee didn't cover the fire services in totality. Uh, I don't know their current rate off the top of my head. I want to say it's like 275 uh, is kind of where they, they held it at. Um, but I, I can double check that and get that answer for you. I, I believe they're they're this, this year they're at 250. I was just curious if they were planning on raising also, um, you know, they're, they're, they're in a little bit of a different situation because they don't have the condos and things that um, five feet obviously is beneficial to the city. Um, but that's fine. I was just curious if you knew if they were raising it this year was more my question. Um, I do not uh, know. Mike, have you heard anything on that? McNally? 
Sorry about that. I'm trying to get my camera. I, I have not heard that yet. I know that they are looking to uh, check on that for next month, but I, I will reach out to uh, Nancy and get an answer. Thank you, Chief. Anything further, Commissioner Vignola? Okay, anybody else? Uh, consensus okay with you all? Nods? Okay. All right, Catherine, looks like you have consensus. Thank you. Now looking at the residential solid waste um, assessment, uh, this is uh, look at the sun, that's where we are. Uh, this is looking at 2018, 19, and 20, the current year that we are in. Again, uh, we don't have any 2021 uh, preliminary uh, assessment rates yet for any of the other cities, um, except that I can say that um, depending on when other cities are going out for RFPs for their service, at that point, that's when we're seeing kind of these big um, these big jumps. I know um, in Davie that theirs is probably going to be going up $100 um, this year because they had to go through an RFP for um, solid waste services. Um, however, for us, we are looking at staying the same. Um, our recommendation is to stay with the $290. Um, I'm, we, we wanted to give you an option. Uh, Rich has been um, communicating quite a bit about the recycling program. So we are looking at continuing the, uh, our recycling to, um, um, to uh, waste energy. energy. And this, if you want to do recycle right, that program, then at that point, the option could be to increase the rate to $320. So at this point, I'm just gonna uh, welcome Rich on if he wants to give a couple words on the recycle right program. And then we'll um, turn it back over to you to see what the consensus is for the group. So, Rich. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Hi, Rich. Let me good unmask here. Good job, Rich. So it's interesting to note that the 290 fee is made up of several line items. I know that Waste Pro is the face of solid waste collection, but Waste Pro only makes up a very small percentage of the overall $290 per year that residents pay. You'll see that on line one collection, the 2020 actual rate is 8628 that gets paid to waste pro out of the 290. Then we go on and talk about disposal to wheel liberator, a franchise fee. The 2020 recycling rate includes a recycling processing fee, which is paid to waste management. Uh, there is no cost in 2020 for the recycle right campaign. It's been done all in house. And you'll see other, which is the hazardous waste program, administrative fee pays to BCPA for doing our assessment, uh, an early payment discount, and the contingency. For 2021, uh, the collection and disposal are pretty much influenced by CPI and on disposal, the volume of waste that's taken the Willow Brader. Uh, the franchise fee remains the same, and, and the Recycled to Waste to Energy uh, program shows uh, no recyclables taken to waste management. We will continue to take it to Willow Brader waste energy facility, uh, there would be no recycle right campaign and the other fees are adjusted accordingly. The option you have is to try to, uh, as I would say, save the recycling program. And again, the collection from waste pro stays according to CPI 8789. Uh, the disposal would be, uh, would come down from the 290 option because now you'd be taking less material to Willow Brader because you'd be taking to the waste management facility. The franchise fee stays the same. The processing to waste management is being forecasted to be $22.46 for the year in the event that the worst case scenario happens we're paying uh, the fees that we we're paying in May, which is close to $75 a ton to process those recyclables. And the recycle right campaign would be $20 per household. So the net effect is that you're paying an additional uh, $20 for Recycle Right uh, and $10 uh, to, to uh, waste management to cover the $30 difference between the 2020 and the 2021 option. So the policy direction really needs to come down to, do you wanna just leave the recyclables to go to waste to energy and kind of work with the county and what the long-term strategy is for recycling, dealing with markets and contamination, or do you wanna continue the recycling collection, taking it to waste management and try to reduce our level of contamination and hope, hopefully the markets do come back someday. 
So that's the difference between the 290 and the 320, if you have any questions. Thank any you. questions? Go ahead, Vice Mayor. And again, my connection's unstable, so I'm sorry if it sounds bad. On the $20 per household, if we went that direction, would that include the recycling of glass that we no longer do? Glass is still a program material. And, and my intention would not to be, would not to disrupt the uh, program materials. Glass has always been a negative for many, many years, but it's so, so, it's so intuitive to recycle glass that uh, it doesn't really uh, damage the overall market value too much. So yes, glass would stay in the program. With that $20 per household fee? Right, so the-, the, the Annual fee or a monthly fee? Annual, annual. Okay. yeah. I think yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, um, and the other $10 makes is goes to waste management on a worst case scenario that we'd be paying $75 per ton to process recyclables, which is equals, we take about 75 to 8,000 tons a year to, to waste management. So that, that amount times $75 gets you to the $22 per household per year for disposal of those and processing those recyclables. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the team at this juncture? No, the vice mayor keeps asking all the great questions. So, one more. <laughs> what yeah, is the contingency? Ahead. What is the yeah. contingency fund? So, the contingency was created uh, last year because, as uh, Catherine alluded to earlier, the town of Davie just went out for bid and their assessments like to go up $100 more per year. We created this contingency to, as a, as a, as a contingency to uh, any huge increases in the future. So the waste pro contract expires in 2024. Should the collection component increase dramatically, it's contingency can serve as a buffer to, to uh, introduce that increase over a number of years. So the increases could be actually charged to contingency rather than take one big hit. Rich, did we use contingency at all to help us with the spike in recycling costs this year? No. Because we terminated the program in May. Gotcha. Okay, I guess you can continue to move on, Catherine. Are we done with this and you're looking for our consensus at this juncture? Yeah, Mayor, we need to know option, uh, which option uh, we, the commission would like us to move forward with, the uh, option keeping the rate flat or the option that would add $30 a year per household uh, with the Recycle Right program. Yeah, so when you say flat, uh, that's a 290 rate uh relative to 2020s which is 290 mm -hmm. or 30 dollar increase right right okay so commissioner sarah what are your thoughts um do we really need the contingency component into it like the the suggested increase with the 290 do we need that uh, to be a line item the piece of and rich just Rich talked about it a little bit. What we had heard from our residents was during the millage increase back in 2018 was they don't like these big, um, big jumps. So this is our way of trying to not have that big jump. Um, clearly, if this is something that that you um, would, would like to see differently, that, that that's fine. And if this is a year to say, you know what, we are trying to keep it as flat as we can, then that's an option. But it is it was staff's recommendation to um, as we heard from uh, the residents to not have a big spike to try to lessen it. Um, and I totally respect staff's recommendation. And I guess in a normal year, I would uh, be in total agreement with that. The only thing that gives me pause is that we are in challenging times and a lot of people are just trying to make ends meet. And, um, you know, if we share with them that we're trying to keep it down as best we can this year with the understanding that um, yeah, the, there it could be a, a, a spike in the future, but we're trying to keep it down now. I, I just, um, the $15 for many people um, is, a, is a big deal. So this is my thoughts. Commissioner, would you, is, is, are, are you thinking to, take the $11.75 uh, $11 off of the 30 or the $11.10 off to 290? <clears throat> uh, the 11.10 out. 
So, so waste of energy and bringing that down to the 280, we'll call it uh, 279. I, I don't know. I'm just talking it out. Okay. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And I think that's important for all of us to be able to talk things out, not necessarily come to a conclusion, especially right. as we'd like feedback, you know, with all of us. Um, so I appreciate your sentiments. I hadn't thought about that in particular. Uh, I kind of like that idea, but how about you, uh, Vice Mayor, and then Commissioner Simmons, and then Commissioner Vignola? And we'll come back to you, Commissioner Sarah. Well, this going back to the statement of, can we afford um, what we have? And I know that this has been our fee and I'm not looking. You got cut off. We heard I'm not looking and then you got cut off. Or the recycling comes with an up. Sorry. <laughs> Getting people with an upcharge to me is, is just not good this time this year. Oh, awesome. Okay, so it sounds yeah. like at least two not really going for the 320. Uh, Commissioner Simmons? I actually like um, taking the 1110 off of the 290 because I was going to go for the flat rate. So um, I actually like taking the 1110 off the uh, flat rate. I mean, um, y'all already know my stance. I already kind of warned y'all a few weeks ago. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Vignola? Um, I guess the 290, we're kind of seems like things are going, right? So um, I guess that's uh, where we'll head. So 290 flat or 290 with Sean's original idea to remove the 1110, which would make it 278.90? I'd rather leave the contingency just to be safe, um, but that's my preference. Okay. Me too. All right, so back to you, Commissioner. Sarah, you've heard from uh, all of us. Any other thoughts or questions? I mean, I definitely would like to get with staff and, and I mean, obviously we're just trying to get consensus on moving the item forward. Um, you know, like Commissioner Simmons stated, I'm trying to keep everything that we can off of our residents and our businesses and, and beyond, so. Um, you know, I'm still um, suggesting we take the 1110 off, but I'm I'm full, I'm very open to moving it forward and continuing the dialogue with the opportunity to talk to staff and learn more um, about the the three options. So I I really appreciate that. You know, I'm going to share. I think, you know, we're in this such an unusual time for so many people. It's a it's a fearful time certainly uncertainty for all of us. Um, and, you know, it all of a sudden hit me, wow, we're going to go to budget hearings in less than three months from now. And I'm the mayor. So I can imagine citizens that all of a sudden are wrapped up, you know, like, oh, well, what happened to the budget process? How come I wasn't heard? And, you know, why wasn't I aware of this meeting or whatever it might be? And it just made me think, so much of the educational campaign we're going to need to move forward to get a lot of people involved engaged certainly share this with all the committees that we have uh, so we have more of a buffer of a surprise because if you recall when we had those budget hearings last september i mean I, if i recall really maybe only eight people ten people were heard uh wanted to be heard and at that time but all of them kind of had the misconception that that would be a great time uh, to possibly, you know, put in their input and change what was being proposed to us um, in September. So there's kind of a lot that I think we need to connect with the residents. So I really appreciate Commissioner Sarah's comments because so much, so many people feel so much financial pressure. I would love to take advantage of the opportunity and say in preliminary solid waste assessment where there have been problems, complaints, that if we can actually lower their cost by $11, I'd be a fan for that. So at least you have all five of us telling you, Catherine, definitely no to the 320, uh, maybe 22 and you know uh, someone on the fence about says 279, 
I think you have enough input from us, uh, but certainly we, we'd all welcome more input from you. I know I at least would welcome more input from the residents. I anticipate everybody really would. And um, so oh, do you have your answer, Catherine, or do you need to answer? Uh, ask Mayor, us we'll, we'll move it forward at the 290, just so we know we have consensus on that and we yes. can always bring it down from there. Okay. Um, and we can have further discussion just for the purposes of this meeting, that's fine. Well, that's what I was gonna say. I wanted I wanted us to just move forward with this. I didn't want this to come back at another meeting or something like that. So I'm not sure where my colleagues are, but you know, I, I wanna try to knock things off. You know, I don't want to have to keep pushing things back, pushing things back. Let's try to take care of it while we can. The next meeting for July 22nd, it gives us um, some time to, to have one-on-ones. And uh, at that point we can provide any additional um, Q and A necessary, but for July 22nd, that's when we actually vote on, or you all vote on the special assessment. So that's when it will come back to you for, for again, uh, discussion. The reason why we talk about it then is the BCPA gets the information for the trim and the special assessments. That's when they put it that information on the tax bills. It's sent out to residents in the month of August. They get to see it. And then they come back. We have our phone number. We have our hearing information on when they can come and talk to us. Um, Tyler Court's phone number is on their on their tax notice, and that's when we talk about it. Um, so Mayor, if you like, we can you know we'll talk to you guys about this during our one on ones for uh, our commission brief. Right. Uh, the other thing is is the eleven ten doesn't need to be a number that is uh, you know there is methodology behind it, but if if that it's what I'm trying to say is not 1110 or nothing. Uh, we can put some in the contingency uh, so that number is flexible as well. Understood. So we can discuss that more if, if that is the will of the commission uh, during your one-on-ones. Okay. Sounds clear to me. Anybody else? Final comments from the commission? Um, Mr. Mayor, just because uh, since I've been on the commission, this is something I've been pretty passionate about. Um, Frank, if you don't mind, um, even before the briefing, I'd like to try to just set up a conversation with Rich. Yep, not a problem. Just let me know. We'll get it set up. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Catherine. All right. Moving on to the stormwater assessment. We are closing in on our first year of a stormwater assessment and the current projects on, in progress is the design work for the corporate park drainage that is uh, scheduled to be the design work is scheduled to be completed um, this year and construction in the corporate park they're going to start seeing um, construction start in november and for our residents in the meadows and dells uh, design work is currently in progress and they're going to see that construction commence uh, this may this coming may and then of course we've talked about the design work for westchester um, starting also but that construction um, will need to happen the following year so the annual assessment last year in our first year uh, was this rate. Uh, we are looking at a $3.47 um, cent increase per year uh, to our proposed assessment to be $119.13. That's a 3% um, um, increase. Okay, questions? Consensus? Got a couple of head nods, yes, a few, yep. You got consensus, thank you. Great. Now those are the, those are the main pieces, um, just wanting um, with the assessments, the overall uh, consensus, thank you very much. For the museum fund, um, I'm gonna circle, as you know that the museum fund came over in, as of January 1, so we had a nine month budget. This is why that's kind of out here so you can see. Uh, the proposed 2021 budget is a 12 month budget. Uh, we will be coming back to you. Um, our auditors have asked that we go back and, and have a 12 month. So that is gonna come, come forth, but the information on the slide is information that you have seen, what is in the adopted budget and moving forward to next year. So what does this reflect? This reflects the museum um, budgeted revenue uh, reflects no changes in programming or sponsorships um, or memberships. Um, all of these areas have the potential to for growth, um, especially when uh, we may have the incoming museum director. Melissa has been very dedicated to this museum fund, as you know, and she's been uh, working 
very hard on that. And hopefully, and she's been communicating to all the applicants and the potential museum director that this is one of the main tasks that they'll need to do is to reduce this structural imbalance uh, to be more, um, the revenues truly equal the expenditures. However, um, taking the direction from, from last, from last workshop is that we will continue to make um, our, our, our folks over there whole. And what that will mean is that the general fund will subsidize the museum fund by uh, 385,000. So I just wanted to make sure that um, that, that is clear. And um, if you have any questions, I see Frank. Yep, um, so uh, the one thing I do wanna clarify here, there is a caveat here. But the $80,000 in the PFM settlement, the city is responsible for that either way. So if the museum didn't exist, the museum fund didn't exist, the city would still be paying that $80,000. So I do want to be transparent with the commission that that $80,000 would be there no matter what. Um, so uh, that is part of that subsidy, if you will. So just want to make sure we're clear on that. We show that out that that expense uh, will be paid from um, the museum fund. It, yes, um, it is a general fund obligation. Um, it is our um, our auditors that want it coming out from the museum fund. So we do have that transfer from general fund uh, right here as a as a revenue into the fund and it coming out right here. That being said, any questions, concerns? I'm going to move on. OK, I have a quick question. Uh, it's not relevant. It's not relevant to the budget, but uh, where are we with the selection process of the new director? So, Commissioner, uh, we, we've we've uh, interviewed candidates, and uh, we have narrowed it down to a finalist that Melissa and HR are working with right now to um, come to a, a final offer, if you will. Um, we do feel that this candidate will be the right fit for the museum to get it back on track with being a self-sustaining fund. Um, but I know that uh, we're very close to making that offer within, I would say within the next two weeks. Thank you. Okay. Our tree trust, um, let's talk about that. So um, this time last year, we were talking about what projects that uh, were coming in and out of uh, the tree trust. Uh, the median improvements and where exactly is on Sample Road from University Drive to 441 and from the Sawgrass Expressway to University Drive. Um, as you know, this is an overall estimate on what would be coming out of the tree trust. And if there's any funds left over, Claudia was um, going to dedicate funds to uh, after Sample Road to Coral Ridge, Westview to, to Wiles. So what does that mean? This is... Uh, what you've seen, this is what you saw last commission meeting. Um, these were the areas highlighted. Um, I typically do not, the practice has been, I'm not going to budget the revenue um, of Cornerstone until I see it come in. That's a little different than what we do with general fund, but um, for something like this, I don't like to see it. I see it, I wanna see it is believe it for me. So it needs to come in at that point, we recognize it as, as revenue coming in. So this is kind of a worst case scenario looking at the beginning balance um, minus that median improvements of 300,000 will leave an ending balance of the tree trust of 375,000. Again, I do think Cornerstone, um, the, that revenue probably will be coming in next fiscal year. Um, and at that point, you're probably looking at an ending balance somewhere right under half a million, um, knowing that you still do have upcoming projects coming in. Um, at this point, um, I know there was conversation um, at last commission meeting, um, so I'm gonna pause here and see if there, uh, there's more com conversation that needs to happen here. Anybody? Okay. Commissioner Vignola, you're good? All right. All right. So I think uh, I smile just because um, the five-year forecast is something that most people groan at, but I, I, I love looking at it. Uh, so it kind of perked me up looking at it. Um, if you look at the, there we go. Kind of, you really actually can't really see the bottom line very, very well. Um, the bottom line shows a slight, um, a slight deficit 
Um, it is about 200,000. It's within margin. Uh, we will uh, we'll get ourselves there. Uh, what we had to do is uh, to be able to get this information in. If you wanna concentrate up at the top, this is the revenues. Um, as you can see, these are the numbers with quite a substantial decrease. This is what we talked about um, in the beginning of the meeting. We'll talk a little bit more on how much, what, which ones um, will are, are the issues and which ones are, are watchful for us. But I do wanna say that we do have a positive every year going forward, um, does have a, um, a, a surplus. It is very important to us to be able to keep our financial sustainability uh, through this. As we've always mentioned, uh, we know that our public back in 2018, when we had that millage increase said, we don't wanna get hit uh, with large millage increases. We have not had one since 2018. However, we know to be able to keep a positive uh, financial outlook, then that's something that we're gonna have to look at every other year, which was the plan. And that will start next fiscal year. Again, not this fiscal year, but next fiscal year to be able to keep this year a positive year. Um, I think I said early on, this is the numerical amount of the general, uh, the city's general fund budget. Um, this is my time just to talk with you all on your city commission line right here on the expenditures. It looks like there is um, a 6.4% increase. What I will say is um, the position that Lou Wam sits in was not fully um, going into only city commission. So we made, we right sides that and that is the increase that you see. What in the line items, um, just like most um, of the city departments, we had to go through a reduction of cost. So the commission line items are a 2% reduction. Um, and I just wanna make sure that um, I have that time to kind of talk talk with you through that. So you'll see- um, Catherine, you're gonna have to repeat yourself. I'm sure. not and quite getting what you're sharing. That's okay. The city commission, this is your line. This is my time to kind of talk right. to you about yours. Overall, uh, we had a 2%, we pretty much had to stick with a 2% a reduction of all our operations. So just like um, many of our operational line items had to get reduced, uh, the city's commission line items were reduced by 2%. It's not really reflected um, here. Okay, so how come it's not reflected here? Uh, because the overall, we're just looking at the overall um, the overall line to the city commission adds up all of salaries, all of travel, all of um, anything that you as commission spend money on come totals to $405,000, as opposed to last year, it was uh, $381,000. Mayor, the main driver here is the difference in Luam salary. Uh, was gotcha. it being fully realized in that line? Understood. Okay. All right. Catherine, before you move on, um, uh, and I know you're going to hit on this, but the one thing I do want to just point out is the reduction in the bottom line uh, from uh, last year to to uh, next year's fiscal year, um, and and the work that it took to get there. So um, I know Catherine's going to go through it a little bit more, but I did want to point out there is a reduction in the overall budget. That's that. By almost by almost three million dollars. Yes. So this is where it was as of 2020 last year, mm -hmm. and this even incorporates. If we go back up here at the top, we look at our ad valorem. Um, this is our property taxes, and um, in, in the beginning of the call, I mentioned that you know it really was it, it, our our property values are are increasing, and that's that's really great for homeowners um, that we are seeing a 4.66 percent increase in property values. So um, that even in key, including that movement, we still are um, having to reduce our budget. And um, as I've said, with with revenues, it's it's these big revenues on intergovernmental. And we'll talk about them in just a, in, in a couple slides and the charges for services on how um, some of those have to go down. We'll talk about revenues um, in just a couple slides. So, Catherine, I was going back to uh, the expense reduction. Uh, what accounts for the uh, the decline of the 10.7% in city manager's office? Um, 
I'm, I'm more than happy to give an exact line um, of that. Some of that is um, there was another headcount um, in the city manager's office uh, with um, a DCM position, and that position is now um, elsewhere in the organization. Gotcha. So that was a little bit of, it, of an in and out there. I will also say that the city manager's office to, um, is having to reduce um, their operations as well. And their line items, uh, line items are, redu are reduced in there too. And then my only other question on uh, what's shaded in green is the 17% increase in non-departmental. And if good you question. already went over it, I missed it. No, no, good question. Um, this is the, we have a placeholder here for some of the um, initiatives that we are about to talk about instead of putting them all in um, throughout the, the departments on where they will go. Uh, we just said a placeholder at this point in time. Gotcha. Um, so if we need to pull anything out, it isn't going through and the old um, HTE system uh, that would probably take one hour to re reduce one line item. <laughs> so. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Sounds good. Please proceed. All right. So what we're seeing is that um, in revenues, a negative 2.3% reduction. This is, uh, we'll talk about the revenues. It's a best estimate approach at this point. Um, at, I like to say that it's conservative. Um, however, it's probably a little more aggressive than conservative. Why we are trying to be able to put as much funds, as much um, revenue, as much money into the community as possible. Um, so I could have shown um, more of a dip um, and then we just have to pull it out of out of expense, expenditures. So we're trying to have best estimates um, truly where I think they will land is where I think they'll fall, not on the side of being ultra conservative. And at the end of the year, then maybe we'll have um, more money that we could have been putting in the community. So um, overall, there are going to be some unknown outcomes. Um, state revenue is still expected to come in in July, August. We have not heard from BCPA. We will hear from them on July 1st for the total taxable assessed, um, value. And that's what we use, um, all cities use for their budget. So I'm still waiting on that number, which can um, tick up or down a little bit. For the expenditures, we're trying to keep that number. 2% um, needs to fall clearly um, under our revenues. So I talked a little bit in the beginning on which scenario kind of did we more or less land. Um, it was more toward that negative 2% um, percent cut that departments had to do. Um, some departments had to go more into the negative, negative 5% um, reduction because we were trying to be able to keep um, our city's um, service levels unaffected and our employees in, um, unaffected as well. Um, the equipment services chargeback uh, relief, that one-time um, tactic that we're using, you can kind of see it down below. This is that $3.2 million um, play that we're using just this year. And in the expenditure side, um, no relief from, from the legislature. Uh, we still may have one, uh, one item in the state budget, though, that we'll talk about in just a second. So overall, uh, on the revenue growth, again, I've talked about the increase in ad valorem. Uh, we had 2.3 increase for Save Our Homes. That is um, that is good. Uh, the revenue declines in state uh, revenues, fines and liens. Our health care cost um, is something that this is a very good. Um, oh, I'm starting trying to get myself ahead of things. Um, this is a good good number. Our capital. Uh, we have our recurring capital in our general fund. It's right around 2.4 million. It does not uh, address all recurring needs. And if we had to say how much do we need in recurring CIP, we're probably around that $5 million mark. So we're less than half of the funding needed um, in our recurring CIP. Um, we've talked about the sworn and merit increases um, still in uh, still in play. And um, I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, this, um, you can kind of look through and re read through that while, while I'm talking. Um, again, the expenditure, this is where in years past we have been uh, really looking at the cost growth and making sure that we are able in last year and in, in better years, uh, we're trying to keep our expenditure rate um, at around 3%. So clearly we're having to swing it 5% downward uh, because we have always been, uh, for the past couple of years, um, our expenditure growth rate has been around 3%. So 
seeing this cut down to 2% is, um, is something that, that we, it's been hard uh, for, the, for our departments to be able to do. Now, the one thing I wanna say this is positive is look for how closely our revenue and our expenditure lines are together. And for those that have watched um, many uh, budget uh, presentations and you'll see the lines going very opposite and the, the revenue line will be way under here and the expenditure line will be way far above. That's what uh, we knew we had a structural imbalance. So that we, the fact that we see these numbers being very closely aligned is, is a testament to um, staying disciplined and um, looking at that cost growth, making sure that we aren't planning to spend more than what we will, uh, what we see in the foreseeable future. So controlled expenditures, this is that line that is really um, a, a lot of hard work that we had to get to being in this place. Um, I've talked about revenue diversification. This is something that our rating agencies uh, look highly upon. It's something that we've also been conscientious about stating and being in that stabilization. On the, that, go ahead. On the five-year forecast trend here, can we, is there any way we can, um, for the next presentation, we can go back to the old uh, bar chart where we're showing how far down, because I think, you know, historically looking at that um, as to where we were, and I, I'd like the residents to be able to see you know, what we used to look at when we did our five and 10 year forecast compared to where we are now. So when we talk about um, the benefits of the tax increase and the um, projected um, very small increases that, that the city is looking at, um, so they understand that. And I, I'd like to see, like I said, the, the prior ones and what we look at now, because I think that's such a night and day difference. And I think that's something we should absolutely highlight. Commissioner, would you like to see five years back, five years forward? Perfect. Sounds good to me. Awesome. Yeah, I, I like. I, I That's why um, I really, really, um, I smile when I see this. Um, the stabilization fund. We've talked about that. The current level is at eighteen percent um, in that range, and clearly in the in the budgets ahead, um, that we are continuing to ma maintain service levels uh, to our residents and businesses, even in these uncertain times. So. Where does the money come from coming into the city? Um, you'll see that $130 million number. And this is how much it's, it's divided up. So our ad valorem um, taxes make up about 48% of the revenues in the general fund. The top eight revenues make up 28% and charges for services and user fees make up um, about 19%. Let's talk, we'll, I'll talk about each of them. Um, our total taxable assessed value increases. You can see what it looked like pre-recession um, back in 2008. Uh, and you can see our steady climb um, uh, of growth, of recovery. I don't say it's not growth, it's recovery, um, which in last year we finally squeaked by and became um, our, you know, we were at $10.39 billion dollars uh, total taxable assessed values, and last year we reached that 10.76 mark. Um, this really doesn't incorporate the cost of inflation, uh, so that you can probably argue me there to say, you know, are we really back? Um, however, these are the numbers that BCPA gives us. Um, this year we are at 11.26 billion dollars um, on on that. We get our final um, count uh, July 1. The growth in our top eight revenues. So what are some of the, what are the top eight revenues? The electric um, utility service tax, the half cent sales tax, um, electric franchise fee, communication services tax, municipal revenue share, uh, lo local option gas tax. You can kind of see just the dotted line is clearly just the median of it. You can see how we've been moving from year to year. And <clears throat> this going into next year, it has this down tick. What does that down tick mean for us? All right, this is a lot of numbers on a page. We're not gonna go through them all. Stay with me on the bottom line here. You can, or the bottom two lines. In 2017, our actuals, our bringing in was about 40 million. Uh, 40 million. 2018, about 41. All right, so we're seeing it about one to 2%. You know, you can kind of go on average and say, you know what, that's about a 1% move for our top, um, top eight revenues. It's a very consistent revenue source for us. They really don't, um, it, they move with the economy typically, unless there's something specific happening, which we've talked about with our CST, our communication services tax. Now, again, 
Look at what happens when we don't have that consistent revenue source. If all of a sudden something happens and we all of a sudden are losing um, from $41 million in our current budget down to next year, 35.9 million. That's the, that's the situation that we're in. This is, again, this is, it's that consistent revenue source. When you don't have something consistent, all of a sudden it drops out. Um, this is the situation that we're in. Um, it's dropping out um, about, you know, right at, right around 8%. Certain ones um, have different plays. Certain ones will, um, we're looking at half cent sales tax um, to possibly be around 25% downward. Um, others may only be 12%. This is something, again, these are state revenues. A lot of these are state revenues that we have not been told by the state and we're just asking our peers around. So these to me are those revenues to watch. Let's watch what happens with the state shared revenues, the half cent sales tax and the local um, option gas tax. So um, maybe uh, next time in, in a month's time that I might have um, numbers from the state, but uh, we'll continue to look. Charges for fees uh, growth average around 3% annually. We typically keep up with our admin and user fees every other year. Uh, we're moving to be at every year. That was a part of the financial policy that uh, Kim's group, my group worked on so much last year. And this will be probably um, coming back to you later this, um, later this year to talk about making sure that we can keep that CPI um, moving forward. But this is showing that downward tick as well. My example was if we don't, if we're socially distanced and possibly some of our sports leagues are not going to be playing in our fields or we shut down our parks or, you know, uh, we can't rent out pavilions, things like that will um, see that revenue source go down. Um, this is also where I talked about City Hall and the Mall. If at that point we can't um, get as many people as we uh, want through that line because of socially distancing, then that's something that this may um, may tick downward for. Now, the good thing is we've also kept that in mind in budgeting for next year. We just don't know how severe um, at this point, but we're trying to be conservative on those on those estimates and encouraging um, at this point. This is a slide on grants. Uh, we receive more than just those revenue sources. Uh, we do receive our grants. Um, Division with Kristen Holowicki and uh, Bradley Falcone, our, um, our dynamic uh, duo powerhouse, and they are able to bring in, at this point, uh, $4.2 million into the, the city. So I'm very proud of the work that they've been doing. This is bringing money into the city. Um, I do want to say that this is still um, on the docket. We still have about 350000 We haven't been told that has been um, cut out of the state budget. This is uh, for parks, security cameras for 100000 as well as um, money for our public safety, um, public works building. So this money could get um, pulled out, but at the same time, we haven't been told that as of yet. Uh, that's still in the state, state budget. All right, let's talk about um, connecting local businesses to grants and loans program. As I said, uh, Kristen and Brad um, bring money into the system. Uh, they have a great idea to be able to turn it around and see how much uh, they could help um, outside. Um, and this is really what they've been able to do in that program. They've been able to um, enroll about 334 people. Some people didn't want to sign a hold harmless form, so then that's completely fine. Um, so at that point, we took the 172 positions, 164 um, companies. At that point, we're vetting through their application process. 79 businesses um, have received funding, and that funding amount that we have been able to receive from the state at the federal level, other community foundations has been $1,324,745. And that is just absolutely phenomenal um, that they've been able to bring that much money to our local businesses. Um, question? Yes. Thank you. Um, just for a clarification purpose, if you could just say, uh, I, I get the grant part, but the loan part of the money, just so people understand where it came from. Absolutely. So depending on what program is that Bradley worked with that particular business to be able to do, some were forgivable loans and some of them weren't. It just depended on um, what that particular option was. 
and the business had the um, the choice to be a part of that or not. It just depended on which loan program it was. Some loans were forgivable, others um, it needed to have been paid back. But the one piece that we kept hearing from our businesses at the beginning of this was that they really need cash on hand right now. So at that point, we tried finding any particular program out there, whether it was a grant or a loan, forgivable, non-forgivable, we were just trying to meet the need that we were hearing that people wanted cash. Thank you. Yes. Um, also, while I'm on just businesses and um, I, I talk, talked about the budget theme really for next year and it became this year as well. This is a year that, as we all know, that we had the business survey and we take that information from the business survey plus all the comments that we received and try to, um, you know, look at our practices, look to see um, if we need to change anything. So I just wanted to pause here and say there are two other programs that we're, um, that our staff is working on for businesses right now. Uh, Susie's team is moving um, on the CDBG, the COVID um, we received, or there is 467,000 um, given, and she is working through that program uh, with our contractors. So hats off to Susie and Nira for that. And uh, the Coral Springs Back to Business program is beginning to send checks out. Um, I think 30 were already sent out and um, 172 are, I think that was the number Christy gave me a couple, couple minutes ago is that's how many are going to be sent out in the next week. So we're really trying to be able to get um, that money um, out maybe before July 4th, um, we were thinking. So great job to Christy, uh, Kim, Brett, and Brad on that program as well. Awesome. That's great stuff. All right. Speaking about reimbursements, we've talked about a little bit um, over the past two weeks. Um, we've had some great news. We've received uh, another about a million dollars for Hurricane Irma. Um, we're dealing with, I should back up, I should say we're, we're dealing with three different reimbursements right now. Um, if one wasn't hard enough, uh, we have Hurricane Irma, um, still working on Hurricane Dorian and also um, COVID and um, the different ways that we're trying to strategize on what that plan is for COVID. So kind of going back to Hurricane Irma, the at this point, uh, we have been, uh, we've been paid about six point nine million uh, from Hurricane Irma. We're still awaiting about $3 million and tremendous work has been has been had by, by Alex Falcone and um, Bob, Melissa, Frank pushing um, to be able to get that money, you all as well. Um, so that's starting to really come in. Again, another million dollars has come in this past week. Um, and I, I hear Alex, um, you know, in the back of my mind, he, he gave an update today saying that we're really thinking that that remaining piece will come in, hopefully before the end of the calendar year, hopefully fiscal year, but calendar year. So okay. Catherine, at this juncture, where does that million go? That is going to go into fund balance. So yeah. that will go into our reserve. Um, and if we need that for, um, you know, how deep this goes um, or possibly it could be there for next year, but it will go to fund balance. At that point, it just will increase our stabilization fund. Okay, sounds good to me. Hurricane Dorian, um, we will um, need to replenish the general fund, the fire fund and the water and sewer fund. Um, then at that point, it replaces the fund balance and possibly it could go to fund balance or it can go to capital if, um, if that's the, the choice that we receive. Um, and then COVID, um, we need to replenish the general fund, fire um, fire fund, actually health fund um, has been actually um, paid out for some of those expenses and, and replenish that once, um, um, once, once we're a little further down the line with COVID. We've actually already, um, we've already submitted one grant um, that will go to, so will go to repay some of the COVID expenses. Um, it was the assistance to firefighters grant, um, and that will, I think we submitted for right, or, right under a million dollars for that. So we're already keeping track, already starting reimbursements for what we're in today. I will pause and say that uh, Kim is working on an open line of credit for about $25 million. Um, the credit line will be for 30 months, which will cover three hurricane seasons. Uh, this is something that we had in place <laughs> bless you, in prior years. You. And... Uh, this is something that uh, will be coming um, in front of you, I believe, in July. 
Jeff, and if we could just change that from Hurricane COVID, because that scared me. That's very Sharknado-like. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I thought that was on purpose. I really thought that was on purpose. Just to you be think I'm testing you. I would never test y'all that way. No hurricanes allowed, especially during COVID, please. You know what? I think someone told me that, um, and I, I took it as a joke, but they probably were just telling me, hey, check your slide. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Joke's on me on that one. The surtax update. Uh, this this is this is some good news. Um, the county has um, moved forward with their plan for next year. Um, Chris and Susie's team um, has been um, has been following this as the as the transition with Paul Carpenter has been occurring. And these are the projects that the county did fund. Uh, the emergency traffic signals at station 71 and 80, and 80, the sidewalk improvement, these are all city projects, and the sidewalk construction along 39th uh, from Coral Ridge Drive to 100th uh, Ave. Then we have the bus shelter replacement um, design as well. So those are some of the uh, projects that will be moving forward um, in next year. Now we also have a Broward County project that's milling and uh, paving and resurfacing of alleyways. So that will be there. Uh, one of the projects that we were really hoping that would be able to be funded, um, it slotted out at uh, 48 out of 50 projects was our roadway resurfacing in five neighborhood um, and in portions of two uh, collector streets. So this is something that uh, they are already working on what next year's submittal uh, will be. Next year, meaning uh, we'll have all those projects ready and putting into the system by February. And, um, you know, hopefully um, that's something that our city really would need um, a bit of reprieve on is our roadway resurfacing. So that's the Surtex update. Question. Yes. Why, um, why are we going after milling, paving, and resurfacing, resurfacing of alleyways. And I asked this because it was asked of me. Uh, you know, people didn't think that was a good use of the surtax fund. So I would love for uh, someone to speak about that. I'm gonna give it over to Rich. Um, and while I'm giving it over to him, this is something that we had to submit. You'll remember that penny tax. Yeah, I remember. Okay. These were all the projects. Right, so, and, I, and I, I get that. So I guess they're, you know, they're wondering why was that even a project to begin with? Or, you know, why is that some, you know, some, why, why that, why alleyways, you know? Commissioner Sandwich, just my, my opinion on it is when you look at some of our alleyways and the way our businesses get their um, supplies and goods delivered, um, there are a tremendous amount of potholes and older roadways there where like even my parents' business, they have a truck that comes in and delivers all types of stuff. And um, unfortunately, sometimes the potholes in that alleyway cause things on the truck to actually fall off. We don't want the businesses having their deliveries come into the front of the business. We encourage them to come to the alleyways and stuff. And it's in certain areas, it's becoming kind of hectic um, for the delivery uh, to be taken up to the alley. So, And so I channeled you, Commissioner Vignola, when I responded to their answer. And that's pretty much what I said. Uh, you know, I guess because you don't have so many alleyways, theoretically, in Broward that people don't really understand that. So I just wanted us to get that answer out there, you know, on a public forum. So... Yeah, and Commissioner Simmons as well. I, I, we're we're as a city, I believe we're responsible for the alleyways we're talking about here. So we would have had to have come up with the money sooner than later to do it. So we, when we submitted these projects, I think it was what seventy million dollars in in projects. Then they chose. We would have preferred them to have given us the road resurfacing over this, but this is what they picked. Oh, I got it. It's uh, it's been it's been it's been uh. An interesting process being on the uh, um, well, not being on the NPO because NPO is kind of different from this. Yeah. But we do talk about the surtax, right? With that, and we did prove approve the mechanism and all that. Um, it, it's it's very interesting, very very interesting. I'll leave it at that. Last okay, thing I'll say on this, just because I I, I I like the avenue we're talking about. Uh, I'm leaving you all alone for this fiscal year, obviously because of COVID. But sidewalks, more and more sidewalks. I see there's some here, but more and more sidewalks. Before and I we, leave this dais, we could not more agree on. more with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Mr. Sam, just on the sidewalk things, I know um, that's one of the things that um, 
when Tony Pazizzi was acting city manager and we met with the MPO, they had said that funding for sidewalks are a really hot thing. And it's something that they, um, you know, if we push, um, we'll be able to get more funding like that. And we've used that. And then you see some of the asphalt sidewalks getting replaced with the uh, concrete where they're ADA accessible. So, but that's something to definitely talk to Gregory Stewart. And I know that's uh, something that they feel is, is pretty easily funded uh, compared to some other projects. Um, Rich has done a great job. He always has a plan. Um, it's always just whether we can fund the plan. So uh, Rich, is there anything just last minute that, that you wanted to add? Because I, I know I've... No, news? no, I have, no, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. All right. Let's look at our, um, our operating millage rate. These were the millage rates from uh, the 31 municipalities in Broward. Uh, these were as of last year. You can see where we are. Um, we can look at now a more narrow view on cities um, similar to us, and this is uh, representative of that. Keeping the millage rate the same is uh, the, um, the recommendation. So the proposed millage rate is 5.8732. Uh, this does bring in $2.8 million worth of revenue because our property taxes um, went up. Um, state law requires a 4-1 vote to keep the millage exactly the same. Uh, the rollback rate is 5.6001 with a, a $2.9 million cut to the proposed 2021 budget, which would be um, in addition to the already cuts that we've, we've made. And if I didn't make it um, apparent and severe enough in my wording, this budget that we are producing is something that staff has gone through. Uh, we are definitely making sacrifices for, for our residents, for our city. We want to be providing the absolute best service levels possible. And we are trying to make it work even within that proposed millage rate. But it is um, very challenging to even make this work. We will because we're committed. Uh, but something like a rollback rate would be something that would for certain be um, cutting services, um, cutting city employees to, to go back to that. Unfortunately, even keeping the millage rate the same, it is going to be advertised as a proposed tax increase. We do, um, we will continue to market and send communication out, not market, but send communication out, um, making sure that it is consistently said that we are not increasing the millage rate. This is a slide that we, we do like to share, how much of your tax bill goes to the city. Some people think when they get their, their tax bill, it all goes to the city. Uh, we only receive about 30% of that. And the school board takes the, uh, the largest chunk out for, for the clearly the, our students, our future. So the school board uh, receives 33.1%. Um, we receive 30%. And then Broward County, is at 27.8% with some of the other um, some of the others as well. Catherine, I'm going to ask you to go back one slide and pose a hypothetical for John. Sure. So the proposed millage rate, um, you know, sticking with staff's recommendations, not having quite the cuts um, as the rollback rate would do. You get a motion for it in uh, a second and it comes up three, two. And then the rollback rate, simple majority, you get a motion and a second, comes up two, three. Right. Now uh, what? Uh, great question, Mayor. What we would do would we would, um, would probably would have another meeting where we would try to meet with each one of you individually to try to come to some agreement or consensus, but if in the end, and, this, and that's and what you're saying hypothetically can happen and maybe even has over the years, but certainly not here. If you cannot agree on a budget at all, then by a matter of law, it goes back to the rollback. It goes back to your last budget approved, which would be the rollback rate of, of uh, 5.6001. So we never approved a budget. That would be the budget in, in the state would, 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 would impose by, by effect imposing through the county by that would be what would be uh, the property tax 5.6001. John, would it would it go back to last year's budget, it, or would it go back? It wouldn't go back to the rollback rate because it would stay at last year's budget, which actually would be an increase 
from the proposed budget? No, it goes back to the no. rollback, which is, is last year's. Yeah, the rollback rate is the, by definition last year's budget. You'd have the Wonder same amount of money uh, coming in as from last year's budget. That's right. what the rollback so that, rate actually is. So that, so for those watching at home, to be clear, uh, as you look at this slide, the proposed millage rate, uh, keeping the millage rate the same because of the property taxes increase and the property value increases, which we love. We love that our property values uh, have increased from year to year. Uh, keeping the millage rate the same gives us that additional revenue. So the rollback rate, as Catherine's explaining and our city attorney's explaining, uh, would need to cut back services, uh, but the rollback rate is keeping the same amount of money, am correct. I correct, as opposed to the additional 2.8 million. Right, it, it, it's last year's uh, property tax reimposed at 5.6001, which was what it effectively was last year. Gotcha, okay. Any uh, questions or comments? Commissioner Sarah, I see you're unmuted. Would you like to share anything? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a quick question, Catherine. On the millage rate slide, I, if I remember correctly, in last year's budget presentation, you had like a five-year projection on that as well. Is there a way to get that included in our next conversation? If, or maybe am my dreaminess? No, I, um, do you want to see the five-year forecast and where our millage rates will need to be? I can, I can, I think I'm, yes, I can give that to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Mayor. Commissioner Vignola. Um, I'd like to see the, you know, we're talking about the, we're, we're telling our residents here that, um, you know, by the proposed millage rate of being exactly the same, that there's going to be a $2.8 million revenue increase. Um, the percentage of uh, uh, property values that went up, right? So what is it, 4 point six six? We Can we throw that in here somewhere? Then also, um, as I'm going through all the slides, I don't see the impact on the average single family home overall when we're talking about proposed fire fee and those things. So for the next time going around, you know, a, a 4.66% uh, increase um, in your value on your home, and then to show, well, for that value added to your home, this is what you're paying. Um, and I think that's something that's important, you know, because for, for an extra $20 a year, you got, you know, whatever the number ends up being, right, you end up with uh, a 4.66% increase in value to your home. And I think that's an investment. And, and that shows that the city of Coral Springs as an organization, we are investing in our community, which in turn will reap, uh, our, our residents will reap those rewards um, if they ever go to sell their home. So I think that's important to throw that in there. I, I like those ideas, Commissioner. That sounds good. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Simmons? Okay. All right. Very good. John, did you want to add anything? No, Mayor. I'm good. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All right. At this point, we're going to move on into the business initiatives. And these are some of the projects that uh, we are looking at. We are gov uh, as I've talked about it at one of our previous city commission meetings, we have our city goals, uh, being a responsible city government, city investment in today and the future, downtown becoming vibrant, growing local economy and premier community in South Florida. So these are what guided, guided us to say, how can we um, continue to um, move our city's strategic plan that you all came up uh, forward. So here are some of the um, small um, items that we are trying to fix and replace. One item that we can, we can talk through any of the items uh, if you if you like here, and it will be the department director uh, that would chime in here. So again, we have five strategic goal areas. The first, responsible city government. Um, some of the new proposed initiatives are uh, record scanning hardware and software for building partner with a retail economist, a 2021 comprehensive plan amendment. This is something that we are um, contractually obligated to do. City security improvements, city hall in the mall, maintaining that queueless uh, system and uh, adding to the 
uh, museum subsidy uh, that general fund is going to cover. Now, some of the ongoing initiatives, this is where you'll see some of the items from the strategic plan that we will continue to, to work toward um, are down here. At this point, I will pause after each one of the goals and ask if you all have any questions. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, the QLA system for City Hall and the Mall and the one-stop shop, is that where they notify you on your cell phone what turn it is for you in line? Yes, that is exactly it. We were able to put that um, in place right now. Uh, we were working on it during uh, Dale's team has been the one uh, that has been doing this. So great job to his team that had come up with this even before COVID happened. And they were able to order it quickly and put it in and install it while the mall was closed and they have been using it since. This is just going into, we need to have a software to be able to support it. So the initial cost was um, uh, taken out of COVID and this is the ongoing cost of it. Thank you. Can you share a little bit uh, about the partnering with a retail economist? Sure, this is something that came out of the economic development strategic plan and that is uh, to partner with a retail economist. A lot of the work that we are doing on the within the strategic plan is a concentration this year in retail. And that is one of the items that uh, was part of the recommendation just to specialize in that retail um, line. Gotcha. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you, Catherine. Moving on to the next is the city investment in today and the future. Some of the new proposed initiatives are the fencing repair, uh, replacement and repair, the irrigation con control system upgrade. This is a three year effort. We are in year two. Uh, the canopy structures replacement at NCP. This is a health and safety item that um, we are starting to see the um, onset of things that we need to repair um, or just take out. So we wanna replace that um, at NCP. The public safety building, second floor uh, UPS batteries. The police dispatch, we are needing to be able to have a redundant AC system. This is something that came about with Broward County. Uh, as you know, we have our dispatch there, so we need to be able to have that to be able to support that. And the Rock Island bike lane and Turtle Creek bike lane, these are uh, part of a FDOT contingency plan that we have been obligated already to be under. You'll see below the ongoing initiatives are um, projects within the strategic plan that will continue uh, in the retreat in July is when we'll talk about the parks master plan and we'll have more conversation about that. I just wanted to put a plug in there for Rob and all the work that his team's been doing. Any questions on this one? Doesn't look like there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Downtown becoming vibrant. Wait, I have a question. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, yeah. Commissioner. Uh, for the bike lanes, I know that I've mentioned this at the last commission meeting and uh, I, I think it was, uh, was it, uh, Julie, uh, that uh, said they were going to reach back out to the Turtle Creek folks to see um, about, well, I guess, yeah, for both those bike lanes to see about that. Have they, have any, has anyone made contact about that yet or? Um, we did, uh, hi, it was me, hello. Hi, um, we, we did talk to um, Turtle Run. I don't know that that came up specifically, but I, I believe there was also someone specific you said reached out to you that you were going to send to me if I remember correctly. So I'll be happy to reach out to them. Okay, yeah, I'll send you that email. I, I just, I want to, I just want to make sure we settle that situation with them first before we move forward with just go ahead and slamming in bike lanes into that area. Um, you know, so I, I just really want us to be cautious with that. Sounds good. We'll talk to them this week. Uh, beautiful. Uh, for full transparency, I'm missing a line here, and that is the Sawgrass 10th Street Advocacy Plan that is still going to be happening in Development Services. Okay. Downtown becoming vibrant, the third of the fifth um, goal area. Enhanced downtown events, entertainment, infrastructure, and improvements in downtown. Um, existing dollars will be used um, in the economic development uh, operating budget, as well as a partnership with the CRA. You'll see the retail strategy uh, um, here, the commercial retail focus in downtown, feasibility study for the Center for the Arts on where that uh, makes sense, and cornerstone beginning of project phase A. Also on those ongoing initiatives are, and I'm gonna read the, all of them just so you know the bottom one, the charter school uh, location, the amphitheater development and village square development. Any questions? Anybody? 
Okay, I don't see any. Thank you, Catherine. Growing local economy, the proposed initiatives, QLIS for queuing in the one-stop shop, e-plan review uh, with Bluebeam licenses, adding those, the Coral Springs Regional Chamber, researching local procurement options, and you'll see the ongoing initiatives of renaming the Commerce Park, increased business retention and expansion visits, entertainment destination strategy, co-work space development, university presence, and corporate park drainage and improvement upgrade in public works. I'm just happy to see the local procurement options uh, on there. I mean, been talking about it since I, I uh, was sworn in. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm just glad to see that still progressing. That's wonderful. And it was also a part of the economic um, development strategic plan that uh, the commission did vote in. So I'm glad that that is there, yes. We've already started working, um, um, Lewis and Kim have already started working on that. And the last is the premier community in South Florida is the historic preservation, revitalized code ranger program, city signage, neighborhoods with integrity. And we also have the public school partnership that's an ongoing effort and the Everglades strategy. I'm very excited about the revitalized code ranger program. I think we need them. Uh, and the Everglades strategy is going to be awesome. And I, I have a question too, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Sure. For the public schools partnership strategy, um, uh, Lynn or Frank or somebody, can we, um, I mean, it's, I know it's ongoing and we might not be anywhere with it, but if there's a way that we can do some type of teaser, uh, the reason why I'm asking is because there's a certain union president that made it known that they have a problem with Commissioner Sarah and I uh, for voting um, for the um, voting to allow that uh, the alternative school to operate in that that area last commission meeting. And so um, I, I mentioned to that union president that, um, you know, I, I was sorry that they missed all those meetings where we showed our support for public schools. And so I would be really appreciative, and I'm not sure where Commissioner Sari is on this, but I'd be really appreciative if we were able to uh, you know, do something as far as a little small social media thing uh, about this public schools partnership strategy. Sure. Um, yeah, we'll, Kat, Kat, we'll I'll have Catherine and Lynn get together and, and come up with something um, since Catherine's our liaison there. Thank you. Well, um, Mr. Mayor, may I? Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe, Catherine, you already had a successful launch with uh, like an initial conversation. I don't know if that was face-to-face -face or over the phone, right? Yes, yes, we had a great conversation. And this overall uh, is, is multifaceted, working with the school board, working with um, BCC, the, the other cities um, with us, principals, parents, our youth, our business community, um, trying to create an intergenerational civic engagement. Um, there's a lot of elements to this. I'm happy it was um, scheduled to come before you. I can't remember if it's August or September, um, but I'm happy to give a teaser and kind of go through what that was. I think I met with all of you back, must have been in January um, time, and kind of developed that um, that plan at that point. But I really haven't gotten back in front of you, so we'll we'll talk about it. Thank you. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Catherine. All right, and we are nearing uh, the the end at this point. I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to talk about some of our special events. When we talk about the budget ahead, the we wanna make sure that we are capturing all um, events in that. Um, and um, Alex, go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Catherine. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and happy to present this budget to you tonight. Uh, this really started back in January when we started to work through actually identifying what we spend on special events, not just from the non-departmental account, but also looking at indirect costs and uh, what it costs in city staff and ancillary support from departments. Um, then COVID occurred and we had to look at which events would not be, uh, you know, would not be going on moving forward and also had to look at identifying those budget cuts um, as we looked across our organization. So the budget that you're gonna see on the next slide uh, captures a couple of things. First. It has the totality of costs associated with it. So it's cut off on the bottom right hand side of the screen, but the total cost right now is $477,588. That includes the budgeted line item amount, and it also includes indirect costs, staff time, 
marketing materials, printing materials, uh, ads that we take out in the paper, all of those ancillary costs that are coming out of department budgets. We've recommended, we have two different columns here. You can see recommend, recommended enhancements and recommended cuts. Um, we had to make some tough decisions this year based on a couple of factors. Um, I'll start first by outlining the last event line, the new parks events. Um, in an effort to be more uh, effective and efficient with our funding, we're recommending creating one line for the uh, parks events. That's gonna encompass our Memorial Day ceremony, our Veterans Day ceremony, um, our, uh, our hopping into Springs um, and as well. So those events are all rolled into that line. So if you look at the recommended cuts, they're going away, but it's all, it, we're still gonna put on a Memorial Day event. We're still gonna put on a Veterans Day event. Um, we've also looked at events that maybe would not go forward with COVID this year. Uh, our first recommendation is the uh, Oktoberfest or Arttoberfest, as it's commonly called. Uh, we recommend cutting that event in, in its entirety due to a couple of different scenarios. Uh, first and foremost, a lot of the beer that we get is imported. A lot of those brewers have already stated that they're not going to host the event. Um, the Oktoberfest in Germany as well were, were canceled. Um, Savor the Notes was a re re an event that was recommended to be cut. Uh, staff has looked at this. We've recommended to repurpose this and brand this as our Juneteenth event moving forward. So this provides us with a baseline that we felt was enough money to capture uh, everything that Commissioner Simmons had envisioned earlier this year. Um, we do have a couple of different events that we looked at areas to trim. I'll, I'll call it fat, but areas that we could trim back. Um, downtown in December, we identified a couple of different things that we could cut uh, while still keeping the intent of the program. Um, and then we also identified a few events where we wanted to enhance it. So um, the Bites and Sips, we looked at how much we spent and the success of that event. We recommend putting some money in there um, as well as the holiday parade. So um, other events that we look to enhance, the 4th of July, um, which we, we really looked at what we can do around that. That's generally a signature event. Obviously this year it's not, not occurring, but we're hoping next year it will. Um, and then we also added two additional events down at the bottom. You have the 9-11 day of remembrance for the 20th anniversary. This is a one year event. This is gonna be in this, this year's budget because on the 21st, uh, October of 2021, that will be the 20th anniversary. Um, we also included in here um, enhancements to our uh, state of the city. So we put $10,000 in for the state of the city. Um, this provides us with a baseline event. I know before we've spent in the ballpark of 30 to 35,000 for a state of the city event um, with COVID and our current budget, this provides us with a, a trim, you know, a rolled back budget, uh, but still enough that we felt would be able to put on uh, a decent event. Um, in the cuts line, um, you can see we moved money from these different events uh, to support the enhancements that I just spoke about. Um, and in, in all, after these cuts and the enhancements, our savings to the city this fiscal year is $58,148.52. Um, I'll go through real quick. Oktoberfest, like I said, that was uh, that event was used to fund most of the enhancements that we discussed. Um, the Haunted House, the Veterans Day Ceremony, that is being uh, rolled into the new park event line at the bottom. Um, the MLK committee events, we met with Dale and his team. We do have a recommended cut there. Um, we were looking originally to help with the Juneteenth offset, but we recommend it using Savor the Notes to cover that. And this will not get rid of any events. This is looking specifically at cost savings. So we usually have a, a banquet. We have some money there in COVID this year. We're not sure if that's going to occur. So we recommend it a, a slight rollback there. Um, we looked at Innovate Downtown this year and the attendance. The recommendation was not to move forward with that event in the future. Uh, it did not have good attendance and we did not feel that it, it, it was bringing the downtown together. Um, the rest of these are, are, are looking at um, World Fest. We looked at a slight decrease there, uh, trying to hit our percentages. Um, our town and Festival of the Arts, we recommend in this budget, uh, you know, cutting that funding. Um, both of those events uh, we felt were unlikely to occur with COVID occurring this year, um, and so we did recommend the removal of them. The hopping into Springs is, is going to be rolled into that new parks event line at the bottom, uh, as is the Memorial Day 355 that's outlined there. So in total, uh, we're requesting 
thousand dollars, one hundred and forty four dollars and sixty three cents this fiscal year. Um, in our indirect cost line, we're looking at roughly two hundred and eight thousand four hundred forty three dollars and sixty five cents to support these events, which uh, leaves us with a total event cost of four hundred and seventy seven thousand five hundred and eighty eight dollars and twenty eight cents this fiscal year. So I'm available to answer uh, any questions that that y'all may have and happy to take some recommendations. Commissioner Simmons first and then vice mayor. Uh, so this is just for the, this is, this is for, this is going into the fiscal year uh, 21 budget. So all of these events, right, Alex? That is correct. Okay. Um, so I guess I, so when you say Oktoberfest or Festival of the Arts, well, Oktoberfest you're saying is gone, period, right? You're recommending that that is just gone, period, right? Correct. Okay. But for Festival of the Arts, just for this upcoming fiscal year. Yeah, so so these are all recommendations for just this fiscal year um, based on our current climate. So okay. I, next fiscal year, when we recommend our budget moving forward, I think we need to reimagine all of these events. Um, I would certainly recommend that we bring back funding to some of these events and we bring back, you know, like Art Oktoberfest, for example, I fully support bringing that event back. Um, but looking at this fiscal year and looking at our needed budget cuts, it was recommended that we not host that this year. Okay, so um, with the, the MLK committee events, what is the $8,000 cut specifically, I guess? Because, I mean, I don't want to take up too much time in the interest of time. I don't want to go through every single one of these cuts. Um, but at least for the MLK, what is that that 8000 Yeah, so I know we have Dale on the call. If Dale, you want to get into the specifics. Um, I know that this was uh, based around the luncheon and looking at taking away some of those events where we were not taking away the event, but cutting back on the those interactions while still remaining true to the education component and the original intent of that. Um, Dale, do you want to give us a little background on the cut on that one in particular? I'm sorry, I don't hear Dale, but I, I, I can uh, also provide line by line outlines yeah. of what each of these cuts are if, if that would help the commission I, 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 think, I think i know i would i would appreciate seeing that because i, I want to i would like to see all of those cuts like you know line by line so if we can get that that'd be great dale is back if you want to share I'm dale. Back. <laughs> sorry i must have hit the wrong button but yes i'm here and alex is correct um what we were recommending is staying true to the educational component um and having the activities for the students and continuing the education of the legacy of, of Martin Luther King and really focusing our efforts on those programs. As you're aware, some, some weekend um, celebrations um, became four days of events over the years and we were looking to make changes to really um, revitalize the program and focus on having you know two days of events and putting all our efforts into that approach. Um, but at this point, we we are still retaining budget for the events in the HR department, as well as a portion of it going to the main budget here that Alex is presenting tonight. Thank you, Dale. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I, I think that Saber the Notes repurposed to Juneteenth was very strategic and very smart. Um, I, I think that's a good use of dollars. The, I think that the city's intent is to reach as many people as possible and to be inclusive as many people as possible. And some of these events I find that are limited in their ability to um, have a strong attendance, such as the International Dinner Dance. I mean, that is restricted between 400 and 425 people. Even though I think it's a great event, I'm the committee chair for that event. Um, the other one I have trouble with is the state of the city. I mean, back in the day when it was a big party, that was fun, you know, and an appreciation to the volunteers. But, you know, the last few years, I just feel like it's it's not reaching the intended audience that it should. And in the Festival of the Arts, which is upwards of 30,000 people in two days, which is music and art and culture and dance, I, I just feel like to, to say no to that, and, and that's another thing, that's the outdoor event. So the likelihood of it happening is a lot, a lot greater than an indoor event. So that's my thoughts. I mean- Vice Mayor, do you think that's gonna happen this year? Cause you had, uh, th there was indication last year when we canceled that that was the death of that event. 
Do you think it'll come back next year? Okay, so last year, this year, this year. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, in in, in the, 2020, the, the one, yeah, the one we just canceled. The county shut us down the week before the event. What's that? So the county shut us down the right. week before the event. Disney closed, everybody yeah. closed. And it really left us in a bad spot with the intent to reschedule it towards the end of this year. That has not been decided yet, but we're talking about next year, March. So, and that would be a, that I think, I mean, when you're talking about reaching the majority of people and being of service to the majority of the residents, you would go, I mean, that is your largest return on investment, 20,000 when you hit 30,000 people in two days versus an indoor event that's limited to 400, even though I like the international dinner dance, I look forward to that every year. But again, that's, that's internal. I mean, inside, people are going to be more likely not to go to an inside event than they would an outside event. And we're talking next year, March, not this year. So that that's my two cents on, uh, you know, where, again, state of the city, it's a nice way to say thank you to our volunteers, but I think we could find another way to say thank you because, you know, it's about the concert and stuff like that because I don't think they, you know, most people are really that concerned about the numbers. It's always, you know, if, if my taxes are reasonable and I feel safe in my city, I'm good. Well, I'm speaking for most residents, not everybody, but most. So. Vice Mayor, can I ask a question? Yes, please. The money that was given to Festival of the Arts, I believe the money was still given this year. Um, yes. Is it still sitting there? The 20000 Because yeah. we could use I mean, that was, towards... It canceled the week before. Uh -huh. A lot of money spent. We have given you know some small refunds, but not uh, not full refunds because we spent the money. It canceled the week before the event. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is is because I don't want you to. It wasn't it wasn't taken out just to take it out. We 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 went through we went based on some assumptions there. Um, so that and that's why we're having this discussion. Uh, if you think it's it's definitely going to happen next year, and if we can find out how much of that twenty thousand is still there. I think that would help us uh, hone in on this if that is the will of the commission. Okay, I can definitely get those numbers for you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vignola. First off, Mr. Mayor, I think we gotta get you some sunglasses because uh, <laughs> these are looking pretty bright over there on you. So, so uh, you know, I, I, I understand. Gotta, there you go, much better. Uh, Vice Mayor, I understand where you're coming from on that uh, completely, but I think comparing it to International Dinner Dance, which is a September event, which would be at the end of next fiscal year, um, I think is kind of hard. I, my personal thing is, I think a lot of these events are gonna remain fluid and, and depending on what takes place with uh, COVID and, and the spread and the vaccination and all those different things, the variables that we really don't have the information on right now. My ask to staff would be that we look at the total number of these events um, and, and keep that in mind and bring it back to the commission as, as time moves on and you know maybe um, I would like to see when, when this is all done, if there is uh, that, that big vaccination that, that we talk about and with our contract uh, with the CDC and, and, and those types of things, if we get to the point where we have our big event, when this is behind us, if this is behind us, um, I'd like to use that to a really great party. Um, mm -hmm. Something similar to a combination of, you know, 4th of July and, and uh, the parade and those types of things. But you know, I, I personally don't see us doing a downtown uh, in December event this year. Um, or a holiday parade. Um, there will be money floating around as time goes on. And we have the ability to look at, uh, you know, uh, the spread of the virus and those types of things. And um, you might not be having some community events at the beginning of the year and, and Festival of the Arts might be one of those. However, towards the end of the year, there might be an opportunity to go ahead and do something like the Festival of the Arts later on. So I understand looking at uh, Festival of the Arts, we all know it's a great event, it's a signature event here in the community. But I think we really need to remain fluid with this uh, special events budget and not just lock in on the line items and the events. So that's my two cents. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. if I may. Sure. Uh, one thing to remember too, this is the first year we're doing this. Uh, we've never had a special events budget before that was all in one place. This budget was spread out amongst a bunch of different line items throughout a bunch of different departments. So 
Alex has been tasked with putting together a special events budget that is in one location that not only accounts for the budget for the event, but also accounts for the indirect cost. So Commissioner Vignoli, you bring up a great point. This is our this is our starting point, and we do need to remain very flexible uh, in, in with this budget. And uh, this is our first uh, kind of shot at this. Yeah, so I, I think it's a great, great first shot. I mean, really great. Uh, I also love the event that Joy's been on the team for and uh, so many past commissioners been on the team for in March and uh, Commissioner Vignola's two cents is worth a lot more than two cents. Uh, just great stuff. And I think being fluid is very important. Uh, I like the overall idea, Alex and team about saving you know, 60,000 from a $270,000 budget for the next fiscal year. I think that sounds great. I think it's fiscally responsible. I think it would be supported by the, uh, by our residents. Uh, I think you may see we have an extra 32,000 or so because I can't imagine we're committed to the 32,000 in the fiscal year 20 budget for the international dinner dance that usually takes place in September. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about that particular dance this September and whether we're committed to using any of those funds this September by contract? Can I, uh, we just had our meeting two nights ago. So I can tell you that the discussion, we're too far into the year right now to make that event effective. I mean, we start planning it within a month or two after the event ends for the following year. And we get a lot of sponsors too for the event. So I'm not I'm clear on why that budget is so high for only 400 or 425 people. Um, but I'm pretty sure we made a decision as a committee, you can check with uh, Lydia, uh, that not to have the event this year. Somebody's texting me to tell me if we did, I can't yeah, read it. Yeah, so as well, Vice Dale, Mayor. Dale, you were there. Dale, I'm what here, and and yes, this the committee did vote, and it was unanimous. Um, I think the only thing they were going to do was follow up with the the lovely lady who always leads that event, who wasn't Gladys at the Castro. Meeting. Gladys Castro, yes, but the majority of the people there did vote and had agreed that they did not feel it was appropriate this year because of social distancing and everything, and the fact that it's like planning a major event that takes several months to line up entertainment and all the other things. Um, at this point, it was pretty much unanimous from the group that it wasn't gonna happen. So Mayor, to your point, I, Mayor, to your point, I would ask that that stays there because we we do have some events that pop up during the year, uh, like the graduation parades and stuff that we had to find money for. Um, so um, that could be reallocated uh, to other events. Yeah, we so, generate 24000 in ticket sales plus sponsorship. So I'm not sure where that 32000 came came up with or how you came up with it. Commissioner Simmons first and then me and then back to city manager. All right. Um, so I think the same kind of line can be uh, given to Bites and Sips as well. I know mean, we're adding more money to it, but you think about the amount of people that come out. Uh, to those events. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big number. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out like if we have to cancel these, what is our plan? Where are we going to, where are we going to put this money? Because yeah, let's say we're trying to, you know, say that we're going to take the 20 out from the festival of the arts, but like, you know, if we can't do bites and sips or something like that, or we can't do unplug, you know, where is that money going to go? And so are we able to, when are we going to be able to look back at this and be like, all right, you know what, this event didn't happen. This event didn't happen, but uh, you know, CDC guidelines are allowing, you know, outdoor events with this amount of people, you know, can, how will we be able to get that money, let's say back to the Festival of, Festival of the Arts? So Alex, if, yeah, I, if I can jump in there, Commissioner, um, doing this in such a way where we actually outline it by event provides us with an opportunity to look at it and remain fluid. So in the event that we don't put on a Bites and Sips event, now we have that money in the 9010 account the non-departmental line item where we can look at that project and we can then roll that to fill in the need for a graduation parade or something else. So the perfect example is the graduation parades, the Juneteenth event, and even our 4th of July event. We looked at those events came up somewhat unexpected within the fiscal year. We looked at money that was saved on events that were canceled and used that as our budget. What this does is it actually outlines it almost by a project. So look at each of these events as a project number. 
if I run under budget on, you know, savor the notes, um, or I run under budget on Veterans Day, that's more money that we can use later on in the fiscal year. So to your point, um, we will remain fluid and we can absolutely utilize it throughout the year. Um, I will also say to the commission, something I forgot to mention earlier, this looks at the cost to put on the event. It does not necessarily look at sponsorships that we might be able to get to support it. So this mm -hmm. is funding that we're asking to provide the baseline of an event. Um, I know that oftentimes we have great community partners that want to step up and make our events even better. Our, our department's working both on grants and on sponsorships to make sure that we can continue to put on events um, while remaining financially prudent. So um, just my, uh, my two cents there. Appreciate okay. that. And I just, let's make sure we just, we have a special events pot. That's all I'm saying. A special <laughs> events pot. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I really appreciate that, Alex, and uh, I, I appreciate not just the plan for agility, you guys have been tremendously agile, you know, since March 13, um, and I think, you know, our residents are in as, as great a position uh, as most cities can have them uh, for so many reasons, so I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Sarah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, outstanding. Um, not only is this, you know, a great way for us to look at the budget responsibly with in, uh, special events, but it also gives us an annual reflection and you know, a snapshot with one uh, quick view. Um, I just wanted to bring up, I, I had mentioned it at the last commission meeting, and it's been brought up a couple of times in this conversation around the graduation parades. I just really thought that that was um, an outstanding way to bring our community together and the faculty and staffs so of the school to celebrate the kids. And I, I know it, you know, we will, it looks like we're going to have some cost savings and we probably we work it in, but I wanted to just uh, formally throw it out there. And I don't know if I have to do this at the <laughs> retreat or now, but I would love to see us add the graduation parades as a line item. Uh, I know that staff got back to me and it, it was, you know, it wasn't a cheap um, five days, but uh, the, I thought that the $20,000 investment in our kids was a good one because it was a great memory that they'll never forget. Yeah, I would second that emotion. Yeah, it was uh, a great pivoting and uh, so much spirit, so much joy and uh, definitely very efficient. All right, anything further from the commission as I pop out of the sun again? Hey, I have one more comment. Sure. I'm pretty sure um, Shirley Richards is texting me and it looks like we spent 40% of the money, so we should have 12,000 left. Okay, Early that's a good amount. Yeah. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Don't hold me to that, but you know, going back and forth here, but that looks like I'm close. <laughs> And again, uh, Frank and Alex, we understand this is a, a jumping off point and where it was before was uh, in numerous places to have it all in one place like this. And like Sean said about the reflection going back, it's great, it's good work, thank you. Catherine, you wanna move forward? Next we have Dale talking about um, the commission meeting uh, dates and times that was requested. Frank, do you want to get start off? Yeah, Mayor, this is a follow up to a discussion I think we had back in December, January, January, December timeframe, um, where the commission had asked uh, about uh, meeting times and uh, had a desire to look at the meeting time. So Dale went out and did some great research and has the results of that research for you. Well, hello, everyone. It's it's well past six o'clock now, but um, we did. We did do a survey of several cities that were our size in Florida. Um, I have a recap of those meetings here for your reference. Um, we also reached out to the cities that we touch upon um, that are neighbors, so to speak, that are smaller than us. Um, and essentially what you're seeing is the majority of them are, are having meetings twice a month and they're having them in the evening. You know, there are a few exceptions um, on this list, um, and I will tell you that that um, we, you know, the city of Lakeland, for example, they're meeting at three o'clock in the afternoon instead of six, um, and the city of Hollywood's doing theirs at 1 p.m. But 
everyone else is kind of meeting around that time frame. We took time to reach out to Parkland, Margate, Coconut Creek, Tamarack, and Sunrise. Um, of all those other cities, uh, most are meeting at 6.30 or 7. Um, Tamarack does a morning meeting as well at 9.30 a.m. and Sunrise does their meetings at 5. So we wanted to come back to you and provide just an, a recap of kind of what's the standard out there or what are others doing. Um, we did ask additional questions about their charter review process and some other items um, that we're not going to go into tonight. Um, we thought this was something that you might want to have and consider as you evaluate what you want to do going forward. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thoughts? We'll start with you, Vice Mayor Carter. Um, listen, majority wins, but I, I like it the way it is, but I understand Commissioner Simmons would prefer that we just go to nighttime meetings and my schedule is very flexible. I can make anything work, but I do like it the way it is. <laughs> Good to hear. Okay. I know Commissioner Vignola, you're not going to be with us too much longer. And I think we've kind of deferred and said, we're keeping it this way in great part because of your preference. Um, and and again, thank you for all your years of service with us. Looking forward to another few months with you. But Commissioner Vignola, what are your thoughts about uh, how we have it and the research done by Dale? Look, I, I mean, um, you know, for me personally, um, it'll be sad for me because my last meeting with Coral Springs will be my last meeting I'll be able, be able to attend uh, for quite a while because some people have to work at night. Um, and, and my meetings and the other community will take place at the same dates and times. But I think the, the flexibility that we provide right now for our residents that, you know, any big item we've traditionally, since we made the switch back, I believe in 2012, um, where we think there's going to be a lot of community input, we'll go ahead and put it on that evening meeting. But sometimes, you know, for our, for our residents and, and for our businesses and stuff, it's, it's um, you know, some people work at night. Sometimes it's easier to come in and come during the day. If you're, if you're a uh, you know stay-at-home mom in the evenings, you're busy running the kids to baseball or dance or or whatever, helping with homework. And during the day, you might have that flexibility. So I think there's a lot of um, um, you know positives of having that daytime meeting. One of the things I think we've kind of missed the mark on uh, in the past couple of years is um, for a few years we were having field trips and inviting schools into City Hall and and having them uh, you know go through go through City Hall and and view a commission meeting. Um, I, I just think that the flexibility there is important. And I also think about, you know, business people, but these are business meetings. Um, and so some of those, those regular daytime business meeting type items, we're able to get on in the daytime and it provides, I think, uh, uh, a benefit to some of the businesses and things that are, you know, flying in, um, coming in when we have a nighttime meeting, they're staying there late. They got to spend an extra night sometimes, uh, uh, you know, in the community before they go back home. So I I would like to see us um, take a look at that and maybe ask, maybe go back and ask some of our residents over the past year that have come out and spoken at meetings, you know, what their preferences are. Um, but I, I think the flexibility of having that daytime and look for, for our employees too, as, as someone who's a staff member in another city, it is nice and it is a benefit. And I think it is a recruitment tool um, to go ahead and have that daytime meeting where in the evenings they're able to spend some more time with their, with their family and stuff. So um, I know we've discussed this and I understand Commissioner Simmons 100% and I, I just think uh, the flexibility of being able to come in front of the commission at any given time is, is important because like I said, when I'm done with the commission, I won't have that opportunity anymore to come in and be involved and say my piece. So, thank and Mayor, thank you for your, your kind words. My I pleasure. I really do. I, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Commissioner Simmons, you're up. You got to unmute. Yeah, I was. It wasn't clicking. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I pretty much said how I felt on this. It's a barrier to access. It's not even just about me. Um, obviously, I, the, the school board has been very gracious uh, in allowing me to attend my meetings uh, during the daytime when I need to. Um, however, this is about looking towards the future. Anything I try to do, I try to set a precedent. It's not just it's not for me. It's for those that will come after me. Uh, and again, this is just another one of those barriers to access. Uh, to get being involved in government and things like that. When you think about how just the structure of government was created, it was really created to favor a few, a few select uh, sort of people. It just, you know, um, sorry, I'm outside. Um, so going forward, I'm always looking for ways to uh, remove or eradicate barriers to access. And these are one of those ways. So, and I, I trust the staff 
Um, you know, as agile they have been, we've all seen them work wonders and things like that. They'll, they'll figure out a great way for us to continue to recognize city employees and things of that nature. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sarah. Completely understand Commissioner Simmons' position. Um, I also agree with Commissioner Bignola's uh, comments about flexibility with the businesses and city staff. Um, you know, like Joy, I'm pretty flexible. Um, yeah, I, 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 I hear Commissioner Simmons' position because I, I know how important it is um, for him to to not only do this job, but also be in the classroom. So, um, I mean, I'm leaning towards keeping it the way it is, but um, I'm welcome to hear more of your comments on it. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I'm very passionate um, on both ends. So in regards to what you were saying, Commissioner Simmons, about barriers to access, uh, I'm about how can we reach as many people as possible as often as possible? Um, and I just, I, I have no doubt that if we did research, how many people are attending and or speaking up at public comment during the day meetings versus how many people are attending and speaking up during the evening meetings since it was changed in 2012, I gotta imagine that the numbers of at least public comment probably is at least two and a half to one. Uh, and we haven't measured attendance, uh, but you guys have been there, uh, you know, for many more years since 2010 than I have been. So you would know. In regards to the, uh, the meetings that I was attending for eight years and eight months between March of 02 and November of 10, uh, the evening meetings work for everybody. They work for staff, they work for the city manager's office. And I think most importantly, it worked for the citizens. Uh, more people got to be heard, more people got to be recognized. I'd love to have the kids come on a field trip during the day when any one of us can be there on our time, when it's staff time that's you know usually there. I know our former city manager, Mike Goodrum, he said, whatever your pleasure is, Frank is saying the same thing, we'll make it work. Uh, so, I I'm hopeful uh, that we get one of you, if not both of you, uh, to say yes. Uh, I appreciate Commissioner Vignola where you're coming from. Um, and I think there are ways to make sure that businesses that want to be heard can be heard if for some reason they can't attend a night meeting. I think more often than not, uh, they can. We usually see city chamber representatives, business owners, uh, at the evening meetings, I think more so than the day meeting, at least that's my recollection. Uh, I'm, I'm passionate, I'm not on the border. Uh, I'm passionate about the evening meetings and out of uh, deference and respect for Commissioner Bignola, for me, um, I've been you know fine having a daytime meeting and an evening meeting. In regards to barriers to access, you know, for those people that are watching, they may not uh, no, you know, we get paid about 20,000, you know, 22,000 over the course of a year. Uh, you don't do this for 17. Money. What's that? 17. That's 17, um, 20 would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we don't and our, and the, and whoever comes after us, uh, you know, I, I don't see our salaries changing anytime soon. Uh, you can't do this for money. Uh, I have a full-time job. I have a law firm. I've got hearings Wednesday mornings that sometimes I may not be able to uh, go because of my commission priority. And then uh, I'm sure I may have had to miss or be late for one of our morning meetings because of my law firm obligation. And I think there are many more um, you know, candidates that might run um, if they have an opportunity to attend the meetings. So I hear where you're coming from, Commissioner Vignola, and you happen to be with one of those cities that have meetings, you know, during the evening as most of the cities do. I think it's more common. I think it makes us more open, more receptive. So I, I'd rather we go uh, to the two nights uh, come November. So any further thoughts or comments about that? Yes, Commissioner Vignola and then Vice Mayor. Just just a, a couple of things. Um, the attendance thing, I, I think the attendance will show exactly what you were saying, Mayor. And once again, that's by design. Staff schedules items that are going to be more discussion for the public. 
purposefully on the evening meeting. So to take that is really kind of unfair because when we talked about doing this, that was one of the biggest things that we said is anything that we think was going to be a um, item like that for, for um, the public we want to speak on. Um, you know, I think that's it. I think to call it a barrier to access and, and Commissioner Simmons, I understand where you're coming from. I also think if we have them all in the, in the evening, it's a barrier to access for the people that work at night. Um, so it could be either way with that. And, and the businesses I'm talking about aren't necessarily the businesses in the community. I'm talking about businesses that are doing business with the city. So if it's a vendor or, or um, you know, those types of things, someone to present to the, to the city commission, um, they could take a morning flight, get in here and then get out in the afternoon and go back home to their families. Whereas otherwise they're flying in and they probably got to stay overnight because they don't know what time their item will be heard and what time um, the commission meeting will be over. And, and that's, and added the expense to them too. Um, but yeah, no, listen, I, I appreciate you guys going ahead. I know, I know I felt um, back in December, whenever this was that we had this conversation, there was a push to move it. Um, you know, and I appreciate you guys working with me and understanding that because it would have prevented me from continuing to serve this community. Um, and, and I appreciate everyone's comments. But Mayor, I will tell you the, the 20 or 22,000, that's the mayor's pay. The commission gets the whopping, I think like $17,000 paycheck. Um, but you know what? It's, it's, I didn't know. I was shocked when I actually got this job um, that I found out we got paid. I didn't know we actually got paid for it. And I think all of us would do it uh, with or without the pay. So thank you, Mayor. You bet. Vice Mayor and then Commissioner Simmons. So I'm a little confused because I thought that this was, we already had this discussion a while back and the change was January of next year coming up. I thought that. Okay. You, I was, you might be right, actually. C Commissioner Magnola really makes a valid that, point. You know that, that is correct. The, the change, the way you guys talked about the change, would take place. It was already in, settled. Sorry. Well, the, the, yeah. But also, but to Commissioner Magnola's point, yeah, he's right. But I think if we're one of the few cities that uh, has still has morning meetings, uh, those those business representatives, they're they're used to this. They know how this stuff goes. So it's not like we'll be hindering them any 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 less or any worse. They they know how this goes. They're professionals. This is what they do. This is their job. So I don't necessarily see that as a problem for them because they have to do this with any other city that they work with or anything like that. So I don't necessarily see that as a problem. So Vice Mayor, did you want to add anything? My connection is unstable again, but I think staff does a really good job of, of scheduling things. Um, that are important to the public for just that evening meeting and everything else is just sort of rudimentary for the morning meeting. So, I mean, what about staff? What do they think? I mean, they're part of this team too. You know, what do they prefer evening or morning? Frank, here you go, Frank. This is at the will of the commission. Staff, okay. staff can support either one. Um, this was changed at the will of the commission uh, years ago and, and well, but it was the city manager brought it up when when it was discussed originally. It was not the commission thing. It was a staff driven initiative. Okay. So just to be I'm clear, argue back and forth. Commissioner Vignola was uh, city manager Dal Donmez that brought it up at the time. Yes, sir. All right, Commissioner Simmons. Anything further from you? Yeah, just listen. Listen how that sounds. Right. It's like we put we'll put the most important or controversial things on one meeting. And then what's the other meeting? Like just, we're just there to just pass things and just be on with our day. Like that, like, I, I don't, to me, that just sounds like we can do, we, we can actually split that up and do better. Have the evening meetings that way, any other person that seeks to run for office, they won't have to think about running for office or keeping my job. They'll be able to do both. Um, so it's just, it just doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me. It's like, we'll, we'll load up the evening meetings, but then we'll keep the morning meetings light. Well, then that's just me wasting, the, me personally right now in this moment, wasting the time of the school board and my students in the classroom. Now imagine someone else in that role that literally will just not choose not to run for office because of that meeting being in the morning, because they have to make sure that they take care of their family and things like that. So I just... I mean, I, I think the right thing and the best thing to do is to have the evening meetings. I don't want to belabor the point anymore because I pretty much said this for like a year now. And, you know, uh, that's that. Commissioner well, Simmons, you can't say sure. that our morning meetings were not busy and productive. Yeah, so just, you know. The, not, compared, not compared to the six o'clock one since, I mean, everybody's agreeing, right, that we load up the six o'clock meetings. The morning meetings, they aren't super like, 
I don't want to say they aren't productive because obviously we're doing city business, right? But when you think about the conversations that we have at those six o'clock meetings versus the ones we have at nine o'clock, not really much conversation and back and forth going on at the nine o'clock meetings. Go ahead, Commissioner Vignola, and then me, and then Commissioner Sarah. The, the commission meetings, you know, I, Commissioner Simmons, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and I understand, you know, when you talk about maybe maybe prohibiting somebody from running for office, but I'm telling you, if the meetings went the other way, it would prohibit me from from being in office, you know. So there's both sides of that. What I'm what I'm concerned about is, you know, look, the, the items that are going to have more people there to discuss, we do put them on in those evening meetings. But think about the the person that wants to come in and have their voice heard in front of the commission. Um, you know, if you work in the daytime, you can come to that one time a month meeting in the evening. But someone who works in the evenings, but they they have a right to be heard also. Um, and and you know, we have a lot of times where somebody comes out in the mornings to speak at that morning meeting because it's more convenient for them. So I, I think it's beyond, I think it's a lot more than just the people that, that sit in these five seats. I, I think it's a lot more than, than just staff. I think it's about providing access to everybody. And again, a lot of people do work in the evenings and have other commitments in the evenings and it provides them an opportunity to go out in front of their government body, uh, the, the five of us that represent them and to have their voices heard also. And I think you know, the flexibility of both ways, but obviously when we have the type of public hearings and those types of things where more people are likely to uh, want to come out and speak. We, we do schedule them that way and we meet the needs as, as best we can. I think staff has really become, uh, uh, has done such a good job with it that even the mayor said, you know, it seems like a lot more people come out to the evening meetings. Well, part of that is by design. So, but thank you guys. Yeah, you bet. So easy can be settled with a survey uh, that's just, that is statistically significant, wouldn't cost much. Uh, but it sounds like Vice Mayor remembered accurately, come January of 2021, there's already been a decision that both of our meetings in the evening. So is that accurate, uh, Frank? Are we beginning evening meetings twice a month in January of 2021? My recollection was that the commission wanted to know what the surrounding cities were doing before that final decision was made. That's why I had staff go out and do the survey. Gotcha. And it looks like we don't have consensus to move forward that way. Yeah, no, it looks like we'll be waiting for who the, whoever wins in November for your seat is going to help us make that decision. That's what it looks like to me. Commissioner Sarah, we're going to have you have the last words on this and then we're going to move on. I'm ready to vote. Yeah, we can't vote at a workshop. Or yeah, you're just you're just sharing it. If there's consensus for two evening meetings, you can indicate yes, there's consensus. So is there a consensus for two evening meetings? Is there a consensus for for uh, one and one? So you got two hands for each. Can we wait till the decide in November? Yeah, that's, and that's what I was just sharing with you. So staff is going to be braced either way right? We're going to have somebody new in November. I'd be asking for consensus now. Can we put it on the agenda for the first meeting after the election? Consensus? I think that's fair. That's fine. All right. You got consensus with that. All right. Very good discussion. I'm glad everybody's so open, so respectful. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, Catherine. We're ready to roll. All right, at this point, it's the, it's the last part of my slide now. We, we still need to go back to the first agenda item, but this is where we are in the process right now. We are at that uh, June 24th business plan workshop. We will, next time we meet, um, there is a commission meeting, but the next time we'll have a workshop, it's going to be actually a special meeting. This is when we're going to set trim and adopt the preliminary assessment. And at that point, that notification goes on the trim get sent out to residents and businesses. They have the um, moment to be able to contact you, contact us, and then we bring it back to the first um, and second budget hearing. I just wanna say thank you very much for Deborah and Sherry Whitaker with her work with uh, Tyler from my team to be able to have such a great uh, timeline and, and document that we can move forward with. So that being said, any other questions as it relates to the business plan? Uh, no, just uh, my instruction would really be to share this as much as possible with the citizenry, get as much input as possible, and uh, to share your presentation to whatever extent you and Frank can make happen. 
uh, to our committees, because I think allowing them just to hear it, if not ask you questions and give us input that way at the least, even though you know we'll be inviting them to the city commission meetings, it's different virtually. I wanna give them as much opportunity to really soak in the realities of what where we're going uh, and not have a negative surprise come our first hearing in September on September 14th. 100% right. We do. Um, I go on a bit of a, of a road show and meet with the committees and uh, groups and uh, to show them what is coming forth before the, the budget hearing. So I will continue to do that. Yeah. And along those lines, I think there was a push to cancel the CIGC meeting and in one of the months. And I prefer not. I, I like to get them educated. And if 10 of them are missing from the meeting, they'll just miss the meeting. Anything else from the commission on that end? Okay, excellent. So we concluded with you, Catherine? Yes, sir. So I believe next on the agenda, city commission comments. Uh, anybody have anything you'd like to share? I just have two questions. Okay, Vice Mayor Carter. You're muted. On the delay of the Village Square development, what And now you're frozen. Yeah, you're still frozen. Now you're unfrozen. Okay. Did you hear what I said? No? Only about Village Square and then we lost you. Okay. I just wondered what the delay was since we're not the builder. Frank, anybody on the team? Able so to we're, we're working with the, uh, the majority landowner for Village Square uh, they're in the, they're doing their due diligence process right now, which has been extended. And um, we've been meeting with them regularly to go over what their proposed uh, development will be over there. But until they acquire that property and, and submit uh, more information to us, uh, we, we really don't have an update on that project, hopefully soon. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, we've had a number of comments about the road improvements in North Springs and um, the temporary speed bumps and the permanent speed humps. And I've been actually selling a lot of property over there. So I happened to be sitting in a neighbor's driveway the other night. They do have a lot of speeders on that North Springs way. And one other thing I think I noticed is the, the temporary speed bumps used to be like three across and now they're two across because even when I was there today, you can go right through the middle of them. So, I'll I'll have Chief Perry uh, look into that and see what's going on over there. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, Commissioner Simmons shook his head no. Commissioner Vignola, Sarah. Uh, I just have a couple of things. I know um, the MPO and, and maybe uh, Commissioner Simmons can can get city staff a little more information on it. Um, but the MPO is having a couple of webinars. I believe they have one. I think last week. They have one coming up on Monday, June 29th at 7 p.m. and also on Wednesday, uh, July 1st at 7 p.m. about Southwest 10th Street and their plans with that. Um, so um, I know Commissioner Simmons is, is on top of the MPO with all those things, but maybe we can get staff to work with him to advertise that so our residents have an opportunity to have their voices heard and, and participate and see what those plans are. So if we can promote that to our chamber and then maybe through social media, I think that'd be a, a good thing. Sounds good. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Sarah. I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. Great. I, I'm good as well. Anything else from you, Frank or John? Um, Mayor, briefly, if I may. Yeah. Um, the uh, county uh, entered into a uh, emergency order 20-18. It's effective on uh, this Friday, uh, and uh, it's if code enforcement issues a citation for a violation of county order, that that uh, that place that is in violation of the, of the county orders. This is the county emergency orders, uh, things like social distancing and spacing and and all that. That the the uh, the business must be immediately closed down um, for 24 hours until 24 hours have elapsed. Uh, they that organization, that business must also submit an affidavit to the county stating that they have reviewed the county orders uh, and they've re uh, completed all required measures. 
Uh, there's a mandatory reinspection within five days to ensure that compliance and repeat violators are subject to a fine of $15,000. So it's, it's really uh, making it much uh, stricter uh, and, and much larger penalties. So um, we have the agreement with the county to enforce their, their orders, of course. This does not affect our ability, of course, uh, to, to educate um, and inform. But if there is an organization or business that continues to violate it, uh, if we make a decision to cite, this is the immediate consequences of that citation. So um, Frank and, and, uh, uh, and, and staff, we've all talked about it, and, and there's going to be an education com campaign to, to, to further uh, alert uh, our, our business owners of this and to uh, help ensure compliance so we don't have to do that. But I want to let you know that that was just signed this morning, or was it yesterday? No, I think it was this morning. Um, and uh, uh, I think we even brought it up at the, the commission uh, uh, meeting, uh, update meeting, and uh, yeah. that's the details of it. So I wanted to give you all a heads up on that. In addition, uh, I, I think I did bring it up, but for everyone's edification, the virtual is going through August 1st. So those are my two updates. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we are, anything from Mayor, you, Frank? Yes, Mayor, we still have to go back to item one. Oh. Thanks for the reminder. No problem. And I apologize that I was late. I was wrapping up a mediation. So, Mayor, we just need consensus. We met with everybody um, uh, for, on the commission, answered any questions. I have staff here to answer any further questions. I was just looking for consensus to either move it forward, to put it on a commission meeting, or to not move it forward. And, and just very summer, summary fashion, What's our benefit and the community benefit to moving it forward? Kathy, you on the line? Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Since you did the presentation last time, I'll, I'll let you field that question. Well, I'll share it with you again, Kathy. Uh, yes. Just in short form, uh, what's our benefit as a city? What is the community benefit? Uh, and. And I'm thinking primarily about our city, but obviously there are benefits beyond our city. So can you share about that? Of course. So the benefits overall, it's going to be a benefit for our city, our residents, and also um, to provide a, a better service for our neighboring agencies as well. Um, I think the camaraderie and the way we work together with right now the city of Coconut Creek and expanding that those services that we're currently providing to our residents. And it's it's not going to hinder our our level of service. That's the commitment that the, the staff has made um, towards uh, this expansion. Because um, if not, you know, we wouldn't have even taken the endeavor and gone through all the processes to even uh, get this far. Uh, the goal is to provide the city of Coconut Creek with the services that we provide to the citizens of Coral Springs but also enhance our own services. This will allow us um, to put some funds in reserve for future, you know, um, when we have to replace our radio system, when the computer software system. So it, it's a benefit in the long run for us. And with the hub solution that's coming into play, it'll also help us with uh, continuing interoperability with other agencies. We're going to be able to do that with Coconut Creek on board. Um, and, be able to, with the additional staffing that we'll get with the city of Coconut Creek, be able to to balance out the, depending on a high level incident, uh, any specific resource with our SWAT medical dispatchers that we're going to have tactical dispatchers, it'll also be a benefit for both cities. Mayor, I'd like to give Chief Perry just a quick uh, opportunity to add to any, anything he'd like to add. Sure. And before I forget, you just reminded me, Kathy, as you were speaking about an organization called Cahoots. So mm -hmm. C-A-H-O-O-T-S. We've been be using that for training. That. You're familiar we've, with that? Yeah, we've actually been using it for our, our most recent training academy. Really? Uh, to teach um, our new trainees uh, our nature codes and our signals. And they love it. Um, and we started using it also in the dispatch center. So it's actually been a benefit. We're doing the trial right now because it's free, <laughs> right. but um, it's they love it and they look forward to it every day because that's how we start our academy. 
uh, with the Cahoots game on, on them memorization game to be able to memorize our codes and signals and different um, things that we do uh, throughout the, the training academy. So they love it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're right. welcome. Chief Perry, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, the one. You're muted now, Chief. I'm sorry? Now you're good. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Kathy did a great job of uh, pointing out the benefits. Obviously, the shared cost is, is a huge benefit for the city, uh, as well as whatever uh, municipalities that we partner with. But to me, one of the bigger benefits is right after the MSD tragedy, you know, we, we made an, uh, a conscious decision to do everything we can to be interoperable and be part of a regionalized system. Now, you know, we, we've looked at our system, we've looked at the county system, uh, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just in two different playing fields as far as, uh, you know, how we dispatch and, and, you know, the equipment we use. And I, I just feel that ours is, is better. So if we're able to regionalize and, and still connect uh, and be interoperable with the other uh, agencies around us, it, it's a benefit to every single agency around us. Uh, it's a benefit to us uh, anytime a, a major incident occurs. And you know, if it prevents anything that uh, occurred during the MSD tragedy from ever occurring again, I, I think it's a net benefit to the entire county. Absolutely. Thank you, Chief. So you've answered my question. I'm not sure which was the other commissioner that wasn't available earlier. You, Commissioner Simmons. Any questions or comments from you, Commissioner? Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Vignola. And then just hitting on, on some of my uh, concerns from earlier. And then I know like financially, yes, it's beneficial to the city. But look, I, honestly, my opinion is every department we have in our city does an excellent job and does a better job than majority of cities across the country, but we're not gonna go ahead and take over everything. But my, my biggest concern, and, and um, uh, Frank, and this is gonna go towards you, right? Can you can you guarantee that if we go ahead and we expand our system, that we're not gonna lose a step and we're not gonna at, at some point make a mistake that this creates that would affect our residents and public safety? I would never give that guarantee. That's it for me, thank you. All right, thank you've heard from everybody. Uh, I, I support it. Uh, I appreciate the work that you've done. So it looks like you have enough of us to move it forward to the agenda, Frank. Thank you. Great, uh, if there's nothing further, we're adjourned. Everybody have a good evening, be safe. See you soon. Take care.